In 1989, an Iowa corn farmer played by Kevin Costner uttered the phrase, if you build it, they will come. In September of 2006, the idea was put to the test. The movie version was a baseball park. In reality, it is a stadium of speed. Today, Iowa Speedway will play host to its third nationwide series race. And if history is any indication, the Heartland is about to produce. The first nationwide series event ever at this beautiful facility. Here's Kyle Busch plowing his way to the front of the field as the battle for the lead is on it too. Go, go, go. Come on, come on. We can't give up track position. I can't beat them if I did the same thing they do. Well, Keselowski stays out, thanks to everybody. Well, they could be a sitting duck or it could be a stroke of genius. Bush, back to the point here in Iowa. 88 car, get his nose underneath Kyle Busch. It's not over. It's a drag race. The 88 of Brad Keselowski with his second win and an inaugural win at Again at it has been all about that bright red and black number 18, Kyle Busch. And Kevin Harvick and Ernie Cope are going to go for the money. It will be a two-tire stop. Here's your battle for the lead. Kyle Busch has caught Kevin Harvick. And Busch taking four tires on the last pit stop. Kevin Harvick holding him off until just then. Kyle Busch across the stripe. Checkered flag. He wins here at the Iowa Speedway. I was worried there with Harvick taking two tires. But I got into my rhythm and got up to Harvick there and beat him. And welcome to race number 12 of the 2011 NASCAR Nationwide Series season, a season that has so far produced five different race winners and is currently led by a 16-year NASCAR veteran who is leading the points for the very first time. It has already been a busy weekend. The NASCAR Nationwide Series is here in the small town of Newton, Iowa. Newton is about 30 miles east of the Iowa State Capitol. The Cup Series, though, spent last night racing for all the money in Concord, North Carolina, about 1,100 miles away. You'll find Charlotte Motor Speedway, home to the Spring to All-Star Race. No points on the line. This one was all for the money. Carl Edwards in this one. This is going to take place in four different segments. This is segment two. Edwards in the 99 taking on the five. Jimmy Johnson, that is for the lead. We go ahead, 10 to go in segment four. Great restart for Edwards, Kyle Busch, and Greg Biffle. Kyle tries to hang on, so does Biffle for a little bit. Watch that 99 car go. Just pulls away on the final lap. Edwards walks away with a million dollars. And at the end of the day, it bends up race car. So much for using that car in the 600 miler next week. But guess what? Edwards has now made the trip because after the backflip, He's got a full schedule this weekend. There are two Sprint Cup Series regulars in the field here today. Last year's Nationwide Series champion, Brad Kozlowski, and the 2007 champion. Talking about Carl Edwards, both of those guys arrived this morning and both benefited by a qualifying rainout. Kozlowski will start 10th to Edwards. will start 4th. Dave Burns, what do you got? Well, thanks, Nicole. First of all, Carl, congratulations on the All-Star win. Uh, and everything in the back and forth, back and forth, has operated pretty much on time this weekend. What's your biggest concern jumping into the 60 car here today? Your biggest concern? It's probably Austin Dillon. He was pretty good yesterday. And um, I'm, just, I'm just having a good day so far. I'm hoping it continues. You know, Mike Beam and, and all these guys have, have worked really hard. And it worked out really well to get a few minutes of practice yesterday. And, and uh, we got Polaris on board. So it's really cool to have them on this Mustang. It's just good to be here. I, I know you probably feel the same way. It's just it's like a state fair atmosphere. The place is packed. People are excited, and it's, uh, it's it's neat to come here and race in Iowa. Okay, now if your good day continues and you get the W today, does your post race celebration routine change at all after what happened last night? I probably won't do any of the excavating. I'll probably just keep it to the backflips. And uh, I think Jack Jack probably wouldn't be cool with two cars in one weekend, no matter what. All right, we'll see how he does today. Mike Massaro, he starts fourth. And we've been chronicling the travel uh, situation for Brad Keselowski as well. Unfortunately for him, he didn't get to Iowa till 10 a.m. this morning. What's it like for you knowing the first laps you'll take today at speed will be once the green flag comes out? Um, you know, I think it's pretty good. I had Sam Ornish, my teammate here who runs on the nationwide side, and uh, he came in and he did all the practice stuff. And, uh, you know, him and Todd Gordon, my crew chief, worked together. So uh, in some way, you just got to have confidence in your guys that work on the car and Sam who helped me out, and I want to thank them for that. And you just got to believe in what they do and uh, that they got it right. And they have a lot of confidence, feel like they've got a car capable of winning today, Nicole. 
Thank you, guys. Iowa Speedway. It is a Rusty Wallace design track at seven-eighths of a mile, and we have a great perch today just outside turn one. That is where you will find the ESPN Pit Studio. Inside, you'll find NASCAR team owner Brad Doherty and the 1999 Sprint Cup Series champion Dale Jarrett. I am Nicole Briscoe. This season has been a season of opportunity for Nationwide Series drivers. Due to some rule changes this year, a Nationwide Series regular will win the championship. And this race, Dale, is an opportunity race with only two cup regulars in it. Who steps up? Well, I, I'm wondering, was Carl Edwards watching or listening to our rehearsal? I because think so. Of <laughs> Thunder. I, I'm looking at Austin Dillon. He's not a regular, and there are regulars that will have a great opportunity here today. But this young man came here, sat on the Poland truck race last year, dominated that race. Apparently, I, this I suits his driving style. He was fast in practice. He's the driver everyone is talking about. I think he has a great opportunity here today to go to victory lane. What about this guy, Justin Allgaier? Was the points leader heading into last weekend's race in Dover? Not off to a great start, though, here. Yeah, uh, Justin Allgaier had a tough day yesterday in practice. Got loose, backed his car, his primary car into the fence, tore up a really good race car. Feels like the backup car is going to be okay, but there's a little bit of an unknown. I talked to Justin yesterday. After everyone was gone, he was leaning on the toolbox down there, just looking at his bent-up race car. And he said, you know, it wasn't the perfect day today. They did not get a lot of practice, so he doesn't feel like he's that far behind, but he's got a long way to go. We're talking about opportunity. We would be remiss if we did not mention the points leader in this race, Elliot Sadler. What kind of opportunity does he have today? Elliot's looking at this as a great opportunity also, but the one thing we have to realize, he's going to have a yellow stripe on his bumper. <laughs> he's a rookie, never been here. So as I talked to him kind of about this racetrack, he realized there's some things that he was going to have to learn. He hoped to take the first part of this track and make sure that he understood exactly what he needed for the last half of this race to try to get to victory lane. Yeah, I talked to Elliot as well as Ernie Copas, crew chief yesterday, and he, Elliot brought up a great point. He says, you know, even though KHI has had a lot of success in the Nationwide Series, this is a new car, and this is a new experience, new endeavor, so each week they get better, and they're learning, and I do think they're going to be very, very good as time goes on. And you think it's almost a must-win. Oh, he's, it's a must-win because he's going to win several times this year, but he's got to get it started, and I do think he's going to win the championship. So it's an opportunity for those three guys, but this is an opportunity race for the two guys starting on the front row. With most of the cup guys staying out of this one, the front row is comprised of a couple of guys we don't often get to hear their names. So we'll talk to Drew Herring and Michael McDowell, plus Iowa Speedway, fairly young track that said it's got a bit of character in the form of a bump so how tricky can one little bump be and then how about report card time let's hand out some grades here we are at the end of the first quarter of this season great time coming up next time that's our countdown Back at Iowa Speedway for NASCAR Countdown. A lot of young drivers in the race today, including Austin Dillon. And there he is right there with qualifying rained out. The field is set according to the most part, the rule book. Dillon is going to roll off third in the 33 car. And it's good to see that 33 car too, because if you were with us last week, the tail end of the Dover race, that car had more than just a few of us holding our breath. On the high side, Logano going for it. Here comes Carl back on the low side. Oh, he's sideways. Oh, oh, now it gets Logano. Oh, he's into the bun. Man, is everybody all right? Definitely apologize if if I did touch Joey. I, I hope I did not. Yeah, Carl never touched him right there. Him. No. We're trying to get that little bit there at the end and um, switch and tear up as many cars as it did. That was a wicked hit that Joey took in a turn for a while. Like the 18 drove through in the back of me like he did last week again this week. That was pretty wild, man. I tell you, I thought I was going over the, the wall. That would have been really scary. Just saw Boyer's car about flipping, and I got hit. Hell, I don't even know what happened. Wow. That was wicked. Well, racing in that number 33 car here this weekend is Austin Dillon, who doesn't only have laps and races here at Iowa. You also won a race, a truck race, last season. How has that past experience at this racetrack helped you this weekend? I think just knowing where I'm at when I hit the track. You can go out there and run really hard, fast, early, and uh, try and adjust on what I need to the nationwide car. You know, I'm trying to get the same feel I had in the truck, and I think we've got it really close, so it should be a good race for us. I want you to finish this sentence for me. With so few cup drivers in the field, this race is a what? This race is a win for uh, all the guys that aren't, aren't cup drivers in here. So we got to go out there and, and run well. But, you know, I really like going against the cup guys. I actually think it's better just so we can go out there and prove ourselves against them. But we got to go do it ourselves. So um, today will be a good race for all of us and uh, hopefully a really good race for me. And you heard Carl Edwards say this is the guy he's watching out there today. Austin rolls off third. 
Well, from Austin Dillon to a driver making a milestone start today, Kenny Wallace made his nationwide series debut at Martinsville on September 24th, 1988. Today, it is nationwide series start career number 500 for him. He will roll off 14th, and we will get to hear from Kenny Wallace, the recipient of a pretty big trophy down there during driver intros. Later on today, because he is our in-race reporter. Well, from race reporters to report cars. We are just past the first quarter of this season, so we figured it's about time to hand out some grades. And who better to grade the drivers than the drivers themselves? I'm giving my team an A. And the reason why is we started in, in, in such a hole and behind everybody at Daytona. We really have fought back here in the last 10 or 11 races. Elliot Sadler to the top of the leaderboard. We've made a very consistent runs at a lot of these racetracks. If I'm going to grade myself, I'll probably be lower, but I give my team an A. We had a lot of changes over the offseason. New car, new owner, everything. And we're racing at Bristol. Bristol was a decent race for us. Qualified second, but it was a long time ago in racing terms. I think that so far this year, I'll give our team a B. Dover was the first race in a long time that we showed up at the racetrack and our car was really good right off the trailer. There was a big stack up right at the line to enter pit road. There's damage on the 32. Had a little pit road incident that, that put us in the back and, and uh, luckily we were able to get back to the top five. I think if I had to grade our team this year, I would give it an A. Biggest reason why is because new team, new crew, new crew chief, uh, putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. Points leader Justin Allgaier, tire goes down on the right front. And if it hadn't been for a, a blown tire last week at Dover, I feel like we uh, probably would have still been leading the points. I'm going to give my team and myself a B plus. Felt like we gave some races away. Miscalculated fuel mileage. Problems with the six. He looks to be out of gas, so he's slow on the racetrack. I've made some mistakes. It's cost us the top five. Um, so I'm getting better. But I think by the end of the season, we'll have an A-plus team for sure. I love the effort that went into those <laughs> grades. You got some shading and some colors. If you look at the top five in points right now, to whom would you give the highest grade? Yeah, mine's not so pretty here. Uh, but <laughs> I give Elliot Sadler, they're leading the points. I give them a B plus. I think there's room for improvement. They've done a great job, as Elliot said, coming back from Daytona, having that disappointment. But they've got some room. They need to step up there, get to victory lane, and then that grade will go up. Yeah, for me, the two guys that were really realistic were Reed Sorensen and Ricky Stenhouse. Ricky Stenhouse, I give a B plus. I give him the highest grade. Everyone else gets a B. You don't get an A until you win. Until you get to victory lane, you don't get the golden star. Okay, so if the highest grades yeah. are a B. What are we looking at for low scores? Yeah, low scores are all Bs. All of these guys are doing an outstanding job, having really good seasons. It's just their runs are, have been very, very identical as far as finishes are concerned. Someone amongst this group of guys, the ones we've chosen, has to step up, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Carl Busch and Kyle Edwards, and Carl Edwards and get to that victory lane. So let me get this straight. The good grades are a B. The bad grades are a B. <laughs> What's the difference maker? Because one of those drivers is going to win the championship. Yeah, I think the difference is going to be the experience that Elliott Sadler brings to his race team. Kevin Harvick there leading this charge. Ernie Cope there. I think they have a really a solid effort going, but I think Elliott's experience, you know, he's raced in the chase in the Sprint Cup side, so he understands about racing for points. He gets the most out of each and every week, and I think that's the difference right now, but if these others can step up, start going to Victor Lane, they're going to put a lot of pressure on them. Experience in the driver's seat, experience for the team. Well, that's the difference maker for this season. You know what could be a difference maker in this race today? We're talking about the track itself because in the last few years, there's been one particular corner that hasn't exactly played nicely. Turn to how do you prepare from that we'll talk about that next on nascar countdown Kevin, live on abc back here at iowa mother nature appears to be playing along today but she wasn't in the best of moods yesterday rain at the track early in the day on saturday meant the end of qualifying so the field as we said earlier is set for the most part based on the rule book. The 18 and 20 cards of Joe Gibbs Racing are one and two in owner points, and that means today's front row comprised of a driver making his fifth nationwide series start and a NASCAR journeyman. For more on them, here's Mike Pissarro. It's shaping out to be quite the weekend for Drew Herring aboard the 20 car for Joe Gibbs Racing. Just your fifth start in this series, Ed. You're on the pole. What's that like? It's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, 
We got a little bit because of the weather, of course, but uh, yesterday our Toyota Camry Sport Clips was fast. We were really excited in practice. I uh, had a good balance in it, so I'm just excited to be leading this field to the start. Uh, we're in Iowa. We've got a great group of fans out here today, and uh, just ready to get this thing rolling. Anxiety's building. I'm just ready to get in the car and get in my office and do some work. The good news for Herring, he has raced here once before. In fact, it was his best career nationwide series finish, 15th last July, Dave. And I'm with Michael McDowell right now. Michael, no wins. You're jumping into Kyle Busch's race car. Explain briefly how that happens and what your expectations are for today. Well, I don't really feel like I've done anything to deserve it, but, uh, you know, luckily I'm very blessed to have this opportunity to drive for Joe Gibbs Racing and uh, have Pizza Ranch here on the car. Obviously, it's Pizza Ranch Victory Lane, so that's some added pressure, too. Kyle's been to Victory Lane here before, and uh, but really just grateful and uh, just going to have a great time today. Um, it's been a long time since I've been in a car that could win a race, so I'm very excited, and uh, we'll see you after 250 laps where we stack up. All right, well, good luck for Michael. He's been on the Sprint Cup Series so far this year. Hopefully that will be good experience for him at this racetrack today. Well, you heard Dave Burns just mention it right there. Michael McDowell is jumping into Kyle Busch's <laughs> race car. This is a car that's won five times this season. Herring is in the 20. It's won once already this year. If you are either of those two guys, how do you manage the expectations that come with just sitting in that seat? Well, I think what you have to do is put in perspective exactly what you're here to do and the opportunity that you have. And it's totally different for the two drivers. They just want to get a good finish, get show what they are capable of being in these cars. But I think for Michael McDowell, yeah, we shouldn't expect any of us that he would go out there and do the things that Kyle Busch does. But I do think that Michael McDowell has the experience to go up here today and challenge for a victory. Uh, that could very well happen, but I expect him to have a very good race. Yeah, I agree 100% with that. Michael McDowell actually drove for me back in 2009. He's a very talented young man. He's been somewhat of a journeyman driver, but he does have a lot of skill. But we can't expect he or Drew Herring to go to victory lane in these race cars. That takes time, communication, and all different types of factors that be feed into getting you to victory lane. But Michael McDowell will do a great job in this race car because he can will that thing. Drew Herring, very, very confident. He's getting his opportunity because of a good relationship with an old buddy, Denny Hamlin. He'll do a super job as well. Good top ten finishes for both of these guys. will be outstanding days. Herring, four previous starts in the Nationwide Series. McDowell, 60-plus starts in the Sprint Cup Series. Bottom line, what's on the line for these two? Well, what's on the line is opportunities down the road, I think, is the biggest thing. Neither one of them want to go out and make mistakes. So they're going to look at this as an opportunity to showcase their talents here today. If for Drew Herring, it's an opportunity for later on, get some more experience in a car. I think for Michael McDowell, this could lead to him getting in a bigger ride, whether it's with Joe Gibbs Racing to sub for Kyle Busch some more, but opportunities and really good equipment to showcase his talent. Yeah, I think if Michael goes out and does what he does best, take care of the race car, run some good solid laps, run up front, be very, very, you know, in, in the mix throughout the race, it gives him an opportunity. But this Drew Herring kid, he is a very confident young man. I spent a lot of time with him yesterday. He thinks he can go and win this race. I don't know if he can or not, but I like his attitude. And if he goes out there today and puts on a show, this could be the great start for this young man that he's looking for. Well, those two drivers will lead the field to green, and they'll be the first two drivers to enter turn two. Dun, dun, dun. It is the famous bump. You know, <laughs> this track, it's fairly new, but it does have some character. Like we said, it's just got a bump. It's between turns one and two. It's over the infield tun tunnel. And, and over the past couple of years, as you can see, it has really taken out a number of cars. So, how do you plan for it? For more on that, here's Tim Brewer in the Craftsman Tech Garage. Thanks, Nicole. A lot of the percentages is nose to wear weight ratio. What you want to do is achieve balance through the corner. The next thing you have to do is work with the shock absorbers. The shock absorber, if you've got too much compression, the shock's too stiff, it's going to chatter the wheels through the corner. But if it's got a lot of rebound, it's going to be pulled down to the racetrack and it's not going to get through the corner. But to, um, to achieve balance through the corners to carry a lot of speed off of turn two, that's what you're trying to do to get through the corners here really fast at Iowa. Next, Andy Petrie in the booth. Yeah, Tammy, talk about some of the challenges of this track and the way you get the car to handle that bump is one of them. This is still a great track that was designed with a purpose. Uh, it's not like the couple of tracks that we've been to, Darlington and Dover, where they're really tricky and you drivers have to race the racetrack. This is a track that was designed to race each other, three, four wide even. I mean, it's got this tra uh, transition and multiple banking angles to enhance that. Rusty Wallace helped design it, and that was the purpose they had in mind, and it's really worked that way. And it's just one of those tracks that... It's got to be a lot of fun for the drivers, Dale. And I know that you know, you're not racing here, never have raced here, but it looks like a fun place to race. Yeah, and as I talked to these drivers about this racetrack, and in particular the bump in one and two, they said that what you have to do is you know it's there. You have to work around that really hard with your shock package, as Tim was talking about, springs and all that. But you have to, because of 
these tapered spacers on these cars, you have to drive them so hard to carry that speed, you're really hard in the gas at that point. So you really have to work around it as much as you can. Have your car going straight, if at all possible, when you hit that bump. You know, the one thing we haven't mentioned today, it's not raining, but there is a substantial amount of wind. We're talking 50 mile yeah, an hour wind gusts hard. at some point. As we're looking down the grid and taking a look at the track, you may have noticed there is one glaring omission from this weekend's entry list. The Roush Fenway Racing 16 car is not here, and neither is the car's Roush driver, Trevor Bain. Bain has already missed three weeks, and the team had hoped to get him back in the car this weekend. In fact, he even tested on Wednesday. Here's the quote from the team. Obviously, we would love to have him back out on the track, but we are not prepared to do that until we are sure that he is 100%. His symptoms have improved tremendously, but we're still not all the way back to where we want to be. And that is Roush Fenway's president, Steve Newmark. That's what he had to say. Brad, he also races in the Cup Series for the Wood Brothers. You spoke to his team owner. What did they have to say? Yeah, I spoke to Eddie Wood, one of his, one of the team owners there at the Wood Brothers, and uh, he talked. He said, Trevor, they went to Rockingham this past week and did some testing, ran a lot of laps. He was very, very fast. Uh, just what they expected, though, when he got out of the car, he was a little bit tired, a little bit of fatigue. He's not been able to do his normal workout routine, so they're looking forward to him getting healthier, getting better, and all we want for Trevor Bain is him to get physically back and be healthy. It, it is about perspective, because it's, it's not really about his career. It's no, about no, no, being right. the individual. Be healthy. But at the end of the day, we are talking about his career. What impact do we think this is going to have on it? I think that, well, he's shown that he has the talent. It's just a matter of getting back, getting healthy. He's going to have an opportunity out there when he comes back with Roush Fenway, so that's the main thing. He has to worry about taking care of his life right now, getting all of that in order, yeah. and he'll have a seat whenever he gets ready. Again, Trevor Bain not in the field for today race it will be led to green in just a few minutes by a couple of drivers we don't often get to see in this series herring and michael mcdowell there's eric Amarillo. carl edwards made it we are just about a half hour away from green and we will be back after this message and a word from our abc station Newton, Iowa is a town of fewer than 15,000 people on a normal day, but this is no normal day. It's race day. Iowa Speedway, a track with a lot of character for one that's so young. Brad Keselowski won the first ever race here in 2009. Kyle Busch won it last year. Who will it be today? It is a full house here in Newton as we are less than about 20 minutes away from the green flag. 43 cars will take the green flag, but Brad, only two of them are cop regulars. You know what that means? Opportunity. That's all you can ask for. You got your chance. You need to go get it. Who do you think we should look out for I'm today? I'm telling you, I think Austin Dillon is the guy to beat. That young man has been very, very impressive since he started racing the ARCA Series. He's earned it the hard way. He's ready to go to victory lane. The guy you were just looking at, though, that was Drew Heron. He is starting today in the 20 car. Joe Gibbs racing. They are number one yep. and two in owner points. Qualifying was rained out, so Herring will start first. Michael McDowell will start second in that 18 car. A lot of pageantry going on yeah, on pit road. Great. I mean, this is absolutely a beautiful facility, a great racetrack. They've done an absolutely phenomenal job. Seven-eighths of a mile. We're going to see a little speedway racing, a little short track racing. It'll be a lot of fun. Michael McDowell, one of those guys with an opportunity not just to maybe win himself a ride in the future, but to win a race today. So let's go trackside for all of the pre-race activities. Listen up, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, in honor of our country and the servicemen and women who defend our nation, please rise and remove your hats as the Iowa National Guard presents our nation's colors. Please remain standing as Iowa Speedway Ministries Pastor Merle Smith offers today's invocation. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for this day and for the chance to be here at the Iowa Speedway to enjoy another great day in motorsports. We pray that you would continue to watch over this track, be with all the fire and safety personnel, watch over and protect these drivers and their crews, be with all of these great fans, not just here at the track, but as they leave here to go home. And as always, Lord, we give thanks and pray for all those who are serving this country, protecting the freedoms that we are here today enjoy. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. He's here to perform our national anthem. Please welcome bigger picture recording artist Craig Campbell. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light 
What so proudly we hailed At the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rocket's red glare The bombs bursting in air Gave proof through the night That our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the There's a lot to talk about today. The pressure of living up to expectations, the opportunity to get to victory lane. And oh, by the way, the wind. No one has gotten career number one at this track. And as we roll closer to 250 laps, we're getting a little bit excited. Well, more, I can't wait. Let's go racing, man. Come more on. from Iowa Speedway Let's do coming it. up. ESPN's coverage of the NASCAR Nationwide Series on ABC. Brought to you by Nationwide Insurance. Nationwide is on your side. The NASCAR Nationwide Series has been coming to Iowa for three years now to the town of Newton, which is not terribly far from several major Midwest hubs. It's about 300 miles or so to Chicago, Kansas City, and Minneapolis. Closer to home, Newton is about 30 miles to the east of Iowa State capital of Des Moines. Now, the Newton population... Normally, it's about 15,000 people. On this day, though, the track, about 40,000 people. Compare that to the population of some major cities here in the state, a few hundred thousand. How about the population up in our booth? Well, that would be three, at least three, the people that you are about to see, Mr. Alan Beswick, Dale Jarrett, and Andy Petrie. Nicole, thanks. Uh, wonderful racetrack. Looking forward to a great race today here in Iowa. Now, there are just two cup drivers in the field. So, Carl Edwards and Brad Keselowski, or one of the other 41. Who are you taking? Uh, I like those other 41. Gosh, we've got two young guys on the front row, Drew Herring, Michael McDowell. They have a great chance here. But then get some nationwide regulars. Elliot Sadler, uh, Reed Sorensen, Ricky Stenhouse. You know, great opportunities for these guys to try to get go to victory lane here today. And do you think it might be somebody that's not in the cup or a nationwide regular? It could be. <laughs> you know, these nationwide regular guys are so tired of these cup guys coming down and beating them and taking these wins away. Today's a great opportunity for them to, to change that, but it might be somebody coming up from the truck <laughs> series. Austin Dillon, he has been great in practice. He's won a truck race here. He looked like maybe one of the favorites in practice to win this thing, so it still might not be a cup guy that wins it, but it, it may not be a regular either. Uh, check out these numbers. The fewest number of people you would consider to be the full-time cup guys in one of these nationwide races in a long time just carl and brad we'll see if it's one of them or one of the other guys that takes advantage of the opportunity now as this race gets closer to halfway andy tires and weather could make this a real stress ball for the crew chiefs yeah and tires are going to be a little bit of the issue but not what you think it could be that the tires are, are actually really good and it'll open up a lot of time or a lot of uh, a strategy for the crews to be able to leave their car out there, especially if we have rain moving in. Uh, they'll be watching the radar and the drivers, meantime, this wind, DJ, how's it going to affect them? Yeah, it could because this is a seven, eight mile track, a little faster than Richmond, so you get to those type speeds, it could really make a difference. They'll have to pay attention to the flags around here. We'll watch the lap count, we'll watch the race, we'll watch the radar, we'll see how it all comes together and telling the story of who winds up winning today at Iowa. Let's get it going down trackside. Race fans, it's time for the most famous words in motors. Sports. Here to give the command, please welcome our Grand Marshal, recipient of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, Patrick Huntoon. Drivers, start your engine! 
Alright, radio check, what is trying to please? Yep. Let's try to just look over here. Let me know if you can't see it. Time to start them here. Lots of trash fly yeah. the floor. Start it up. All good. All right. Oh, you hear me good? How cool was that for Patrick? We wish him nothing but the best. Special day for Patrick. A special day for our in-race reporter today, Kenny Wallace. From St. Louis, Missouri, on a very historic day, Iowa, give it up for Kenny Wallace! I wanted to join in with everybody else to celebrate this day with you and tell you how proud we are, and good luck today. Five hundredth start for Kenny Wallace. The free race presentations, the lap around the track with some of his family. We'll talk to Kenny and get ready to go green here in Iowa when we come back in just a minute. Field of cars for today's NASCAR Nationwide Series race rolling out onto the Iowa Speedway. Four parade and pace laps before we go green. Qualifying rained out. Field set basically according to owner points. You see the starting lineup rolling across the top of the screen. Time to talk to our in-race reporter. 500 starts. Second all-time in the Nationwide Series for Kenny Wallace, DJ. Kenny Wallace, Dale Jarrett, ESPN. You have a copy? I hear you, Dale. Go ahead. All right, buddy, let me first say congratulations from everyone at ESPN on your 500 start. And our question comes from our mailbag, Jake, in Nanticoke, Pennsylvania, says, Kenny, with Iowa being very similar to Richmond, do you feel like you have a legitimate shot to win based on how well you ran there? He also offers his congratulations on 500 starts. Well, first of all, thank you, Dale. You're a champion, and it means a lot you uh, talking to me. This racetrack is uh, similar to Richmond. But it's not the same, so uh, my car is driving good. That's all I can ask for. Let's hope that the uh, rain did not uh, mess us up too bad. We'll see here in a little bit. All right, Kenny, thanks for talking with us. Again, congratulations. Good luck on this 500 start. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you later on. Thank you, Dale. Kenny Wallace carrying one of eight high-definition onboard cameras that'll help us get right down into the heart of the action today. I think, uh, and you mentioned this during countdown, DJ, that guy top left there is one to watch through the day. Yeah, there's no doubt. Elliot Sadler's looking, uh, had this kind of race on his radar as one to go to victory lane. And if you want to watch somebody coming from the back, well, we'll have more on that 31 story with uh, Justin Allgaier. Right now, Mike Massaro with a report from Pit Road. Michael? Yeah, after relinquishing the championship lead and slipping all the way to fifth in the standings a week ago, Justin Allgaier arrived this week with a very much big picture focus. Unfortunately for him, things did not go as planned. Just 23 laps into practice Saturday, he slapped the wall, wrecking his primary machine. Instead, today, he'll start at the back of the field in a backup car with zero laps on it. The objective today, to climb back into the championship picture, put the Dover disappointment behind him, but in order to do that, he'll have to overcome what has already been a rough start to his Iowa weekend. Shannon? Well, it's taken 36-year-old Elliot Sadler 11 races to get there, but he is now the points leader. Something else he is here this weekend is a rookie. Sadler's never raced here in Iowa. Check out that yellow stripe on the back of his car. I spoke with him after practice. He told me he's still trying to figure this racetrack out, but added, it is a lot of fun. Dave Burns? Carl Edwards commuted between Concord, North Carolina and Newton, Iowa this weekend. Why? Well, because there were two races to run and potentially two to win. Last night, he won the Sprint All-Star race in North Carolina, and that was worth a million dollars. Today's race may be worth just a little bit less, but it's no less important to competitor Carl, who hopes he can win from fourth starting spot in that white number 60 Mustang. Alan? All right, David, thank you. We will keep an eye on things on the racetrack today with all those uh, onboard cameras. We'll keep an eye on things on pit road today with Rick Yeomans, our over-the-wall reporter. He's the rear tire changer for Mike Wallace. Rick, have a great race. Appreciate your carry our camera for the day. And as the field comes around to get the one-to-go signal, we check out our Goodyear track facts for the Iowa Speedway. And while we look at some of the numbers, make mention that because of heavy rains overnight, NASCAR will put out a competition caution at lap 50 in this race to let the teams have a look at the tires and so on. Yeah, you see that progressive banking in the corners. These drivers I spoke with think that this racetrack is going to widen out, let them race two and maybe three wide. And the one-to-go signal given there. We remind you that the broadcast today available in Spanish by activating the SAP button 
on your television. We're glad to have you here with us for our coverage from Iowa this afternoon. That is Justin Allgaier, right of the picture, dropping to the tail of the field because he's in that backup car. And, of course, Carl Edwards, one of just two drivers uh, who are doing double duty for the full season. Carl winning the Sprint All-Star race last night in Charlotte. Now back aboard his nationwide car, giving his team a little pep talk on the pace line. Done such a great job. Like I said, I know we'll have to work on his thing, but uh, thanks for everyone's hard work all during the week. And uh, let's uh, have a good day. Have some fun. Yeah, Tim Floor. These guys have been doing great. He's been doing an unbelievable job. So he's got to keep doing what we're doing. And crew chief Mike Bean giving the team a pep talk as well. Be very interesting to see how this track changes over the course of the race. Be very interested to see how difficult it is for Justin Allgaier to get up through the traffic. And what about these guys at the front in the Gibbs cars? The 20 machine, Drew Herring on the pole. Michael McDowell on the outside. The full house of fans in Iowa on their feet and we're underway. Herring gets clear in the 20 car. He's going to lead lap one. Here's Edwards wiggling and wobbling up turn four. Yeah, I think early on with all of this rubber washed off this racetrack, that bottom groove is going to be the most important place to be. Now somebody forgot to tell Carl Edwards. He's still working that high side. Yeah, he's got the back end hung out off every corner on that high side. Now he tries to go to the bottom. Pressing Michael McDowell for second spot. McDowell had a handful of steering wheel up off the turn two. Talked about it on Countdown, the big bump there where the tunnel accessing the infield goes across the middle of the track right about there. And it can sometimes make those drivers grab a handful of steering wheel to keep control. Yeah, the way they kept the coil behind the front of these cars with the springs there, it makes it a very rough ride through there. And it goes all the way to the top of the racetrack, so it's not like you can dodge it. Elliot Sadler in the two, Austin Dillon in the 33. Working on Carl Edwards in the 60, that's for third spot. This is a fast racetrack. It's seven eighths of a mile, and you've got to have the car so free to make it, make the speed around here. So it's kind of treacherous for these drivers. It will spread out the groove wheel, but you really have to have the car free. Now, I'll just point out quickly also, somebody else to keep an eye on today, that yellow car right there, 32 Reed Sorensen. We haven't talked a lot about him yet in our telecast, but I suspect we will as the day goes on. Yeah, he likes these type of racetracks. You, you can think back to other uh, the track in St. Louis. Similar to this, and even though this isn't exactly like that, it has a lot of speed to it. And Andy, as you were talking about, you have to make that car turn in the center. That's where that bump down in one and two comes into play because a number of drivers will tell me if your car's loose there, then it accentuates that. If it's a little bit tight, then it makes the front end go away. So you really have to work hard. Yeah, going back to Reed Sorensen, he's been so good at that track in St. Louis, winning a couple races there, that he's used to handling these kind of issues with bumps and carry and, and that's, that sort of thing. And this is a unique track as well. So uh, he's had a solid year so far, too, uh, Reed Sorensen has. Well, how impressive are these two Gibbs guys in these cars, starting on the front row, not a lot of experience, but jumped out there and put a little distance on the rest of the field. Yeah, looking at Drew Herring, he started on the pole in a, a USAR, uh, USAR uh, AR Pro Series race, and yeah. he finished Easy second in that race with a lot of laps. <laughs> Easy to say, though. Easy for you to yeah. say, yeah. <laughs> now let's check on Justin Allgaier. We documented his story just before the green flag. And talked about watching him try to pick his way up through the traffic. 31 car there, Allgaier. First laps in this race car are these first laps in the race. They never got out of the backup car after they crashed on Saturday. Yeah, I talked to Jimmy Ellidge, the crew chief on the car, and he said that they had, this is actually not a, a great backup car. They wish they had something better, not quite as good as their primary car. They're, they're going to have better backup cars as they go. They've been really concentrating on their primary cars. But this is a car they're in at Bristol, so they had some confidence in it. Michael, got more? Yeah, I echo the thoughts of Andy. I also spoke with Jimmy Elledge. I asked him what was on his mind after wrecking the primary race car. He said, quote, I wish it kept raining. Obviously, they had a lot of faith in that primary car. The attitude for the driver, though, a lot different. I spoke with Justin Allgaier after the crash. I asked him what his expectations were going into this race. He kind of gave me a blank stare and a wry smile. He asked me, do you remember where I started in Bristol last spring? Of course I did not. He reminded me he started at the back of the field that day as well. He went to victory lane. 
He came across as very confident. He knows he has a long way to go, but believes he can get the job done today. And just before he crashed that car in practice, he set the fastest time so far in the practice session. So he does have confidence that he'll run well. Didn't Carl Edwards mention Austin Dillon when we <laughs> interviewed him in countdown? Dillon just by Edwards for a spot. Now Edwards trying to come back. This is uh, racing for fifth and sixth here. Yeah, a little lesson there about these cars for young Austin Dillon. He made the pass down into turn three. Got in there a little bit too hard, though, was up the racetrack. Allowed Carl to get back, but he's able to power around in turn two. I think right there you see the better car really prevailing in that battle. And Austin Dillon, like you said, getting some of that experience from somebody like Carl Edwards, really invaluable. See, Ricky Stenhouse coming into the mix, too. He was here all day practicing what practice they got yesterday. Expect a lot out of him here today. And what about Brad Keselowski? We talked about all guy, our first laps in that backup car when the race started. Here's Keselowski did not get to come over here and practice on Friday because practice was rained out. Didn't get to practice yesterday. Chose to stay in Charlotte, concentrate on the cup race. His first laps in this race car, the opening laps of this race. He said he had a lot of confidence uh, in Sam Hornish, who obviously is a teammate there at Penske Racing. It looks like uh, Sam must have done a pretty good job, but a little bit loose there. <laughs> trying to hold it out a little too long getting down into one. Uh, the spotlight's bright glare, huh? <laughs> so Kislowski uh, hanging in there right now in eighth position. One of the winners of the two previous Nationwide Series races at this track. Of course, Kyle Bush the other. Kyle not in the race today. Watching Edwards 60 and Stenhouse in the six. Rosh Fenway teammates racing for sixth and seventh spots. Right there you there see was that, that bump. bump. Yeah, yeah that, that was really a, a big wiggle for the 60. And Carl says, okay, need to work on this a little more on a first pit stop. We are caution free so far. Caution free so far here in Iowa after 14 of 250 laps. We return to Iowa after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Wendy's Flavor Dip Chicken Sandwich. Fully hand dipped for flavor you can't resist. <laughs> Fall in love today. Watch Allison Floyd weeknights on News Channel 15. The NASCAR Nationwide Series live from Newton, Iowa, and the Iowa Speedway early going of today's race. You're watching the Joe Gibbs Racing tandem, but not the drivers you normally see in those 20 and 18 cars. It is 24-year-old Drew Herring, a North Carolina native, out in front in the 20, and Michael McDowell in that 18 car. They started 1-2. They are running 1-2. Again, still early in the going today. Mentioned Kenny Wallace becoming the second driver in the Nationwide Series to get 500 starts. Another piece of history for today's race. The first time in Nationwide Series history that three female drivers have competed in today's race. Jennifer Jo Cobb there in the 13, who has been running the series regularly all season. Joined today by Amber and Angela Cope, 27-year-old twins. Yes, related to the Daytona 500 winner Derek Cope. They are trying to pick their way up the racing ladder. Washington State natives moved to North Carolina. They've come up through kart racing, and they're doing late model racing, and they've run a truck series race and now making their way into the Nationwide Series. We picked a tough race to do it at, I can tell you that. <laughs> this is a tough track by talking to these drivers. See, Josh Wise on pit road now. Looked like he might have had some type of brake problem as he came on the pit road. Really, really slow, and then the crew had to stop the car in the pit. Yeah, they got the hood up, and you see the official waving at the rear of the car. They must have... An issue with the right rear caliper brake line, something back there. Shannon, you have more on Josh? Yeah, guys, uh, just hearing from the team that it's actually a brake issue with the seven car. This is something that they struggled with last time they were here in Iowa. In fact, Tony Jr. told me yesterday they had to bleed the brakes twice during the race because he completely lost them. Josh Wise, that is. So they use a little bit more of a, an aggressive package here today, but right now they're having problems with them all over again. Andy, I'm not the crew chief, but 25 laps into the race and you're on pit road with brake problems. It's yeah, that, it sounds like they've probably got some kind of malfunction more than, than say, just you know abusing the brakes to failure because it's too early for that. Uh, looking at the rear of the car, that's the least uh, stressed part of the brake system is on the rear, so they probably just have some kind of malfunction back there. Third, fourth, and fifth. Elliott Sadler in the two. Reed Sorensen in the 32 being chased down by Austin Dillon in the 33. Did, did I hear 
Brad call that uh, this race a must win for Elliott Sadler earlier? Well, I think that I think he's he's got to put himself in a position. They're getting to that point. They need to do that. And my question is, are we did we make sure that Drew Herring and Michael <laughs> McDowell got in here? And that's not Joey Logano and Kyle Busch because these guys are doing a great job. I was talking to McDowell yesterday. He had the fastest laps during practice for quite some time in that 18 car. He got out of the car. They were making a big change. He was all smiles. I mean, it was pasted from ear to ear. And he came over, and we were talking, and he said, you know what? One of the biggest differences is, he said, when this team makes a big change, you go back out there, and you have an idea what the car is going to do. He said, sometimes in some teams, you make a big change, and you never know whether the splitter is going to be bouncing off the track or it's going to be wiggling and wobbling. or where. He said, this team's cars are predictable. And as a driver, that allows you to give them better feedback. I think it really says a lot for the people that Joe Gibbs Racing has you know, running this operation. That, you know, Jason Ratcliffe is a great crew chief, and he does things in a very methodical way. And Kyle Busch has been a big part of building this team. I mean, he's, you know, he's built this thing with with uh, with the crew and the crew chief. And, and, and for somebody to get into that thing, like Michael McDowell, I can see why he'd be all smiles. I mean, who wouldn't want to get in this car? Yeah, and even though there's a lot of pressure, get those comparisons to, to produce like Kyle Busch has done this year, that's a lot of pressure. But you have to believe in your talents, and when you know that you have a team behind you like that, it makes it a lot better. We see Reed Sorensen take that third spot from L.A. Sadler now. Sorensen 2.6 seconds behind the Gibbs guys. It is Herring and McDowell running 1-2. Again, competition caution coming up if we don't see a yellow first. About 20 laps from now. Caution free so far in Iowa. And the rain looks like it's going to stay away. ESPN's coverage of Major League Baseball continues. ESPN Sunday and ESPN 2 Monday night. First, it's interleague play on ESPN Sunday night baseball. 8 Eastern, Starlin Castro and the Cubs head to Fenway Park to take on Adrian Gonzalez and the Red Sox in the rubber game of that series. Then on ESPN 2, it's Monday night baseball at 7 Eastern. The Red Sox starting a three-game series against the AL Central leading Indians. Major League Baseball, ESPN Sunday and ESPN 2 Monday here at Iowa. New leader in the NASCAR Nationwide Series race, Michael McDowell. It's a lot of traffic right now. You can see ahead of him. But Michael McDowell does a little better job of negotiating this traffic. He takes the opportunity to take the lead. Yeah, I'm just, it makes you wonder, did Drew Herring get out there a little too aggressive? You see him three wide here with the leader. Making well, him aggressive. Yeah. But you can see Michael McDowell really kept his car on the bottom for all of these first 38 laps. And that seems to be the best place right now. I'm not sure that's going to change throughout this day too much. We're going to have multiple crews, but that bottom is going to work the best. Kind of accordion accordioning back together after spreading out for a little while. This group uh, racing in the heart of the top ten. Elliott Sadler in the two, sliding back to fifth. He's got Stenhouse in the six and Edwards in the 60 chasing after, with Edwards now sliding up into the sixth position. What's Carl saying, Dave? Well, Alan, he started fourth, so he's lost some ground because of a loose race car. Thankfully, his team knows what that means. That's because of the guy on the right. Brian Eichler was a substitute driver who jumped in the car after Carl left this racetrack yesterday to go win the sprint all-star race. Eichler said, when I jumped in the car, the track changed tremendously, and we were able to try things on the race car so that the 60 car has gone through the gamut from being very loose to being very tight, and crew chief Mike Bean knows how to adjust to that. Right now, Carl's car is too loose. He can't wait to get on pit road and have some adjustments. I know the track really hasn't changed any but the, as far as the bump, but it sure is showing up. And we see that shot there of those cars going across that, that tunnel where that bump is, and it really is upsetting a lot of cars. Looks like Carl's struggling with that sound, too. Second place here, Sorensen on the move, trying to get by Herring. Sorensen in the 32. Andy, let me throw one other thing at you. Might it also be this is the first time this next generation nationwide car is here with that splitter? Does it just look like the bump is bigger because well, of the way the cars are? Alan, these cars do have less total travel than the old cars did. They're restricted on how much they can travel the car uh, by that splitter you see on the front. So they have to stop that travel with that with the spring and it's really harsh. And so that's probably a lot of it. You're probably right there that they have never run this car here before. No place, no place for the car to go because uh, you got to keep that splitter up off the ground. Now Sorensen chipping his way toward the front, Dave. Alan, we were talking about brakes earlier to the negative side with the Josh Wise car. That yellow 32 of Reed Sorensen yesterday spent a lot of time working on changing brake pads. Sorensen wants
on a brake pad that when he stopped on the brakes didn't catch the car quite as harshly. Crew Chief Fred Owens told me that they made that brake pad replacement and it really helped his entry into the corner. It didn't get as loose for him. He was able to control the car just like that as he passes Harry for second. Yeah, Dave brings a, a good point on brakes. Uh, they're kind of like tires. They have different compounds, and the, and the softer compound pads will actually be a more aggressive uh, feel when you hit the brake pedal, stop the car quicker, but they can cause some problems. Uh, the other thing with brake pads is you want them to release quickly, too. When you let the brake pedal off, you want them to release, and some do that better Five than others. Five to the top, yellow, three back. Yeah, and as a driver, you can get in there and you can adjust that brake bias. So if you get that pad that doesn't stop it quite as quick, but you need a little bit more rear brake to help your car maybe in the center of the corner, then you just adjust that instead of having all of that pad. As we see, wow, a lot happening yeah. right here in the turn one. Big lap traffic for some of the lead lap cars. Edwards is through it. Kozlowski and Stenhouse are racing through it. 39 car they're trying to work around is Luis Martinez, Jr., Last year's Rookie of the Year in the NASCAR k West Series, one of the steps on the NASCAR developmental ladder. Yeah, you see Jason Leffler, who's in the night spot in that 38 car there. He's made his way up into this mix also. Heard the uh, team radio a minute ago. The competition caution just a few laps away. By the way, Josh Wise just leaving pit road and rejoining the race in the seven car. He's going to be 25 laps down. Ouch. I don't think that's what they had in mind. No, that's just unfortunate. We're showing the two car there, some of Elliott Sadler, and I was talking to him about this racetrack, and I asked him a lot about that bump because it seems to be something that everybody talked about. I hate that we keep talking about it, but it's very prevalent. You can see it so much. But he said, Dell, I'm trying to, to make a comparison of a track that you've run that we have a bump that affects your car that much. And he says, honestly, I can't think of anywhere. He said, it's probably the, the biggest bump that, that we have that really affects you that much. And that's not a negative against the track. Rusty Wallace and everybody here have done a fantastic job with this racetrack. But you, they, they've tried to do some different things with it, but it keeps coming back. And uh, it's an issue the drivers have to deal with. You don't make it too easy. No, that's right. Yeah, nobody said it needed to be easy. If you're not familiar, Rusty Wallace, our colleague, uh, designed this racetrack along with the architects and the owners who built it. Uh, Rusty wearing his dual roles today as team owner and racetrack uh, designer and uh, will rejoin us on the broadcasts uh, in coming weeks. Competition caution. caution is out. You know, and going back to Rusty Wallace, he was very involved in, how, in designing this racetrack. He was hands-on a lot of the times. I saw pictures where he was here when they were building it, so he did have a big hand in the design of this place. You talk to the drivers, they really enjoy the challenge. You, you talk about a little like Richmond, but extremely fast. You have some of those characteristics, a little bit of loose end, but you have to make your car turn in the center to get a good drive off. All right, talking about brakes and the seven car getting back on the track, Josh Wise. Tim Brewer in our Craftsman Tech Garage before the pit stops has a little more. Tim? Thanks, A.B. The hydraulic brake system is used by fluid, and anytime you've got air in it, you have a soft, spongy pedal. So what they're doing when they're bleeding the brakes, they're putting additional fluid in the reservoirs and forcing it down through the calipers. These are the bleeder holes right here. You open them, and you let the air out. But anytime you've got air in behind the piston right here, you're not going to have a firm pedal, and the car's not going to stop. A.B.? Not good air in the brake system. Tim, thanks. Michael McDowell led eight laps in his first 72 Nationwide Series races. He's already led more than that today as the second leader of the race, and he brings the field onto pit road for stops at the end of lap 52. Shannon? It's going to be a track bar adjustment for Elliott Sadler, who said he needs more right rear grip. They are going to take four tires on that number two car. Dave? Two of Reed Sorensen started fifth. He's moved his way up to the second position, top of your screen. They're going to make a track bar adjustment for a loose race car. Michael McDowell, the bottom, uh, like in the middle of your screen, right there. His car wants to be just a little bit better. They're going to make adjustments as well for him. Mike? Drew Herring saying his car is no, very no, no, good early the way, in the run, but as the run progresses, it gets a little bit loose off and tight in the center. They'll make an air pressure adjustment and a four-tire change, but problems getting off pit road. Very go, go. slow. A problem at the end of that pit stop for the 20 car. Stall it, have it in the wrong gear. Yeah, it looked like he might not just give it enough gas. With these tapered spacers, you really have to rev that engine up once they drop the jack. So it will be Michael McDowell holding the lead off of pit lane. Elliott Sadler's crew, nice job. And you see Herring and Dillon sliding back a few spots. First caution is out. It's a competition caution here at Iowa Speedway. McDowell will lead him back to the restart. 
going racing in one more lap in the John Deere Dealers of Iowa 250. Make sure to go to NASCAR.com for all your latest NASCAR information. Michael McDowell, Reed Sorensen will share the front row. Elliot Sadler will be in the back row for this restart. Speeding, entering pit road, and it kind of, when you look at this, becomes pretty obvious. Yeah, you can see Elliot right here comes in behind Brad Keselowski. He's going to jump out and actually pull up beside of him. And the problem is, is this continues right into his pit box, and they just didn't get slowed down enough. Clear. Three, two, one. Now, if you have that kind of a, a line in front of your pit, if your timing line is in front of your pit, you're okay doing that. But his timing line ended at the middle of his pit box, so he was his average speed was just too fast. So Sadler goes from seventh at the caution to 23rd for this restart. McDowell on the 18, choosing the outside lane, and let's try it again. wasn't the place to be. McDowell a little bobble in one and two, and Reed Sorensen goes through to the lead in that yellow 32. Yeah, I've never raced here, but was a little curious about that choice, and especially seeing how the bottom, and that's where Michael McDowell ran the whole time on that first segment, so uh, if he gets that opportunity again, I think we'll see a different choice. <laughs> Reed Sorensen saying thank you very much, so. Mistake one, okay. Mistake two, then it becomes... Yes. Yeah. Look at this, three wide. Ryan Scott in the 11, Kozlowski in the 22. That's Ryan Truex in the 99 on the outside. These drivers were telling me they expected this racetrack to widen out. But hopefully it's wide enough for all of this. It's a lot of action happening. Well, you see the sun is out now, so that's going to change the track conditions a little bit. Maybe it'll take rubber a little better. Oh, see Ryan Truex wow. getting way out of shape in the 99. Settling down just a little bit. Truex uh, losing some ground since the restart, Mike. Yeah, they're not all that concerned about it, though, Alan. Uh, and that backs up what I spoke with Jerry Baxter about earlier this morning. I asked him point blank what's on his mind going into this race. A big smile came across his face, and he said, we're real confident. This is the best car we've had all season long. It's the best weekend we've had with Ryan Truex. And, of course, it comes at a pretty good time, too, for that kid. This is the ninth race in a 10-race contract for him. Beyond Chicago, he doesn't have anything else on his nationwide schedule unless sponsorship comes on board. So he's really trying to showcase his talents today. So far, a pretty good run for him, Alan. Ryan, the younger brother of Sprint Cup star Martin Truex Jr. And he has slipped back a pretty good chunk since that restart. He restarted like sixth, and now he just lost a spot to the 30 car, Busher, so that's going to put him back in 14th. Yeah, it looked like he really was struggling getting back to the bottom of the racetrack. Looked like the car's pretty loose. There's not much rubber up on that high side right now. On board with Justin Allgaier in the 31. Justin did a nice job in that first segment, not having any laps on this car, but he worked his way into the top 20, now sits in uh, the 15th spot. So that was a good first segment. Was able to work on his car, see if he's made it any better here. You can see Ryan Truex really fighting that 99 car, really loose. Kind of confirm what you said a minute ago about not much rubber in that outside lane. And I was going to ask Andy, you had never heard that before. And I know <laughs> I've said that before. What you do to this thing? Yeah, I've heard it plenty. But it's easier said than done getting to the bottom when you've got a lot of fast cars trying to pass you down there. So Truex back in 14th spot. Allgaier 15th. Joe Nemechek right behind them in the 87 car in 60th position. Word is, word is that there may be uh, a Nationwide Series debut of former Formula One star Kimi Raikkonen in a Nemechek-owned 87 car. Uh, as of uh, last reports, that is not confirmed yet. But that would be kind of exciting for next Saturday in Charlotte if it does Yes, happen. it would. He did a great job in the truck race on Friday night. So uh, working his way right there. And we'll welcome him. See what he could do next Saturday. Shannon? 
Well, Alan, I did speak with the team this morning about that entry and if Kimmy is going to be in the car next week. What they did tell me was Joni Machek will be in the 97 next week at Charlotte. That's the plan. As far as who will be driving the 87, they're not confirming as of yet. They said that we're going to have to wait till Monday or Tuesday. But of course, Joe being in the 97, all signs kind of point to that, to that might happen. That'll be fun if it happens and uh, give us something to look forward to uh, besides the normal great racing you get in Charlotte next week. Well, the car lever's having a problem good. here. Yeah. He got real loose in three and four. And he's checking for a flat tire, looks like. Yeah, I think he's doing that. Plus, he's having to scrub off that rubber. It will build up a little bit up on that high side. Get on your tire. Have to get that off of there immediately. Carl back to 10th position. Lost some spots on that round of pit stops. Back at lap number 52. Yeah, he's up where nobody's been so far today. That, that is where all the trash is, Dale, and I'm sure that's what he did is he got a lot of trash on the tires. Dave, what's up with that 60? Well, he restarted ninth, so he hasn't lost that much ground right now. The reason they lost all those spots on pit road, myriad adjustment. That means a lot. It was mainly <laughs> that spring rubber out of the right rear that was the big deal for Carl. That took some time, plus wedge, plus crack bar adjustments on the 60. Remember, they, they left it adjustable because Carl wasn't here, and now they're going through that transition of trying to get it right. They better hope they have some more adjustment left, Dave, because I don't think the car's right yet. Yeah, and I appreciate you telling us what those big words you used, Dave, so I appreciate that a lot. But even if he would have been here yesterday, these guys are seeing a totally different racetrack than what they saw yesterday. Not nearly this much sun and, and heat in this track. So Edwards, again, uh, losing five spots on pit road, uh, now running back in 10th position, and is about six and a third seconds behind Reed Sorensen. Sorensen out in front as we work lap 70 of 250 here at Iowa Speedway. The NASCAR Nationwide Series Top Gear 300 at Charlotte coming your way next weekend, Saturday, 2 Eastern on ABC. It's a place where Kyle Busch has been pretty good. Four wins in the last six races there. Kyle, though, not in the field here today at Iowa. And so far, we've seen three different winners. Right now, it's Reed Sorensen leading the way. He is really, really strong. He's worked his way up and just has taken over this race. But Michael McDowell, Drew Herring, these two young men have done what they needed to do thus far, running up front. Michael McDowell has worked himself into having a fabulous race thus far, running second, Herring's running fourth. I like what they're doing. Opportunity race for a lot of these guys. Let's get you caught up with what's going on throughout the field. Next one, going to get you up to speed. Dave Burns, what you got? Hey, Nicole, we told you about that brake adjustment they made for Reed Sorensen yesterday. This morning, I asked crew chief Trent Owens, did you make any last adjustments for Reed to race the car better today? He said, you know what? We gave him a little bit more can stand on the gas in the middle of the corner, and he's been standing on it so far today. Reed Sorensen, your leader. Second place, Michael McDowell lost that lead on the start. He also lost some practice time yesterday. Why? Well, because his crew was late to the technical inspection line with this race car. I asked crew chief Jason Radcliffe about that. Jason said, you know what? We've got high expectations. Sometimes you got to seize the day. They didn't mind losing 15 minutes to make this car the best it could be. Running in third place right now, Austin Dillon in the 33. Austin uh, has a truck series race here under his belt. In fact, that was a win. And asking him how he would drive this race today, he said the tires don't fall off much. It's just about hitting your line. In fact, you have to hit it perfectly here. If you charge in too hard, you make the center of the corner tough. If you back it off to go in, you make the exit of the corner bad. So you have to do it just perfectly, Mike. Dave, Drew Herring started this race on the pole in just his fifth career Nationwide Series start. I spoke with him yesterday about the opportunity, and he said the pressure, it can eat you up if you let it. Consequently, you've got to wonder what was going through his mind after he stalled the car after his, his first pit stop. His team came over the radio immediately afterwards and calmed him down, said, hey, kid, you're doing fine. Keep it up. Throughout the course of this race, he's really leaned on his spotter, Mark Robertson, who happens to be the spotter on the cup side of the operation with Joey Logano, who has been coaching Herring throughout the course of the day. Just behind him is Brad Keselowski up into the top five. Sam Hornish set that car up. The concern coming into this race was how much would the balance change from Hornish's driving style to Keselowski's driving style. Well, they ironed this out well before getting here. In a recent test at Gresham Motorsports Park, both Hornish and Keselowski were there, and they took some time during that test to swap cars to get an idea of how the information would translate from driver to driver. It appears to be doing a great job this afternoon, Nicole. You know, Nicole, also looking at Eric Almarola, I mean, he has done an outstanding job of getting that car up into position. Every week, 
we hear about him and Pop Seary talking about trying to get this car in position to win. He just doesn't want to run well. He wants to be in that top five all day long and have a chance at the end of the day to go to victory lane. He's doing a great job Don't so far. Don't forget about Justin Allgaier, up 31 spots. Ooh, he's currently he's running in at 12. More from Iowa as we're working lap 83, 250 to go today from Iowa. More from Iowa Speedway after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Travel east out of Des Moines on I-80 and you come to the town of Newton, Iowa. Population 15,000. A perfect plot of land found here on which to build the beautiful Iowa Speedway. Opened a few years ago today hosting the NASCAR Nationwide Series for a third time. Look at those grandstands. They are full. All the permanent seating for this race sold out. Sometimes the track adds temporaries on the end in some of its past years. First year with a couple of nationwide races. They went a little bit conservative on that, but could have sold more tickets. And it will, in fact, add some more temporaries for the second race that comes up here for the Nationwide Series on August 6th. Beautiful day, big turnout. Right now, a big day for Reed Sorensen in that 32 car. He is out in front by almost two seconds since the restart. You see a battle here between teammates, Ricky Stenhouse and Carl Edwards, but what I've really seen with Reed Sorensen, he's worked the traffic really, really well. Now this battle for third heats up. Austin Dillon had been in the third spot. And Drew Herring trying to take that away. A wiggle wobble there. Hey, watch Carl Edwards. He's moving all over this track trying to find something to make his car better, see if he can make speed. And I, I look at the monitor, and in some laps, he's the fastest car on the track. Other laps, he, he's not when he's searching for that line. I've seen him actually move up the racetrack about a half a lane, three quarters of a lane down in one and two. They're going through middle of three and four here right now. Carl actually, moved actually up and made that work. Uh, the last lap, he was the quickest car on the track, even with the pass. Coming up on the 93 car, that is Amber Cope. Running back in 31st position. Again, Nationwide Series debut for her today. And we continue to watch Herring and Kislowski and Dylan here as, uh, as they race for third, fourth, and fifth. 33 car slipping back just a little bit, Dave. Yeah, his car was loose on that first run, Alan, as he challenges Keselowski here. He's going to lose that spot, too. They made a track bar adjustment for him, but he just reported about three laps ago, still loose in and off the corner, and that means that back end wants to swing around on him too much. Not a good thing when um, those walls are so close by at such high speeds. Yeah, and that seems to be the tendency here as I talk to drivers that that's what they thought was going to happen, and now that we have a lot of sun uh, shining on this racetrack, I think that's what these drivers are going to fight. But you have to be careful, Andy, because you get it full, you get it tightened up on the exit of the corner, and then you make that center too tight. Well, that's the thing. You're fighting. You, you want the car as fast as possible. And the way to do that is have it balanced perfectly, not, not pushing and not loose. But, you know, if you get on the tight side, it can really kill the speed. Sometimes you can deal with a little bit of looseness. Uh, the driver, it's, it's a little harder for him. But it can be, you know, a little quicker than being too tight. You know, Reed Sorensen, we just saw the uh, the numbers there on the laps that he's led all season. And today, only six laps led in this entire season prior to today. All at Talladega, by the way. A little bit different style racing than most weeks on the series. So really, really solid day for that 32 so far. He did the tire test here back in April as driver, as crew chief. A tire test. Advantage, no advantage, doesn't mean anything. Oh, it's a big advantage, Alan. You come to this track and be able to just put laps in. Uh, you're gathering data all the time that you're doing this, and then you get to run on the tire that you're probably going to race here. I think it's a huge advantage to be able to do that tire test. Yeah, and you're exactly right, and it is from the driver's standpoint, too. You come back knowing what your car is. You don't have to take that time and trying to get acclimated to the racetrack again. So, yeah, it is a huge advantage when you get that opportunity to do that for Goodyear. And they try to spread that out with the teams uh, to sit, give them all opportunities to work on their cars at different places. Talking about opportunity, one of the themes of our day, whether one of these Nationwide Series championship contenders can break through and stop the cup onslaught of wins. It's been since March 20th of last season. Since a Nationwide regular won a race, that was Justin Allgaier at Bristol. It's been cup guys every week ever since. Brad Keselowski's running third. 
<laughs> Reed Sorensen leads. Michael McDowell is second. There's McDowell in the 18. There's Kozlowski chipping away at it. Little bits at a time. Got a win here at this racetrack in the past, does the uh, driver that 22. Under the green with Reed Sorensen leading here at the Iowa Speedway. Reminder on ABC Monday, it's the Dancing with the Stars finale. It begins when the final three face off for the last time. Kirsty Alley, Chelsea Kane, and Heinz Ward. Who's going to be crown champion and take home the Mirror Ball Trophy? It's the Dancing with the Stars finale. It starts live Monday at 8, 7 central on ABC. Trouble in turn two. That is Ryan Truex. He blew a right front tire. Pretty hard to lift. Truex was running 17th at the time, second caution of the race. We talked just a little while ago about how important this day was for them. And it started off so well. He ran really good the first run. Something in that second run didn't uh, his car didn't like, and he went went back quite a bit. Now he's blown this tire and uh, ruined his day. I got nice right, so check up the right side. Make sure look at look. Make sure you got a broken rotor or something like that. You know what I mean? So. See what we can see of it. And yeah, so he's already hit the wall there. But you can tell yeah. by the angle that the tire was down when he went up there. Yeah, I happen to be looking at it right in the middle of the corner. You could see the car just take off to the right. You have to wonder if something wasn't amiss at the on that restart because it came out fifth and just continued to slip backwards. So, yeah, we don't yeah. know exactly what it could have been. Okay, so on the last round of pit stops, Drew Herring in the 20 had a little trouble getting going off his stop. Uh, Reed Sorensen, 32. Had a little hiccup on their left side change. Didn't lose any ground. Let's see how things shake out this time as the leaders come to pit road for the second time in the race as they complete the 111th lap. All right, Dave, here they are. Reed Sorensen will pit for Sunoco Fuel. A little bit tied off of the corner was the driver's complaint. They'll make an air pressure a change for that. Meanwhile, second place, Michael McDowell. Three rounds of wedge for that race car. Very, very loose right now for McDowell. Mike. Brian Keselowski saying he is a little bit free in and off tight center, however, looking for a little bit more drive off. They'll make a, an air pressure adjustment and also a four tire change on this uh, 22 car as they take on a full load of Sunoco race fuel. They're down and away. It's like everybody about hold serve 88 car. Picking up a little bit of ground there. Almarola up four spots. Elias Adler makes up seven. Nice job by the uh, Kevin Harvick Incorporated group. Uh, Sandler had made a lot of progress under the green flag. Watch Ryan Truex back in the frame. No, that's not good. Got a blown tire going to wall 99 behind us. Celebrating 100 years of the Indianapolis 500. Daly Sullivan going down low. Can he make the move? Side by side, Sullivan has the lead. Danny Sullivan. Oh, oh no! Dougie. And just at that moment, losing control of the car, doing a magnificent job of not hitting the wall. Oh, it's unbelievable. The incredible move maybe ever in Indianapolis. We may have seen the most dramatic moment of racing. Danny has won the 69th Indianapolis 500. The Indianapolis 500, telecast presented by GoDaddy.com. Coverage begins Sunday, May 29th, 11 a.m. Eastern on ABC. Well, it seems like every year in the Indy 500, there's one moment that you come away from that race talking about on uh, Monday, the day after. See what this year's is when the 100th Indianapolis 500 unfolds one week from today. See Jason Leffler back on pit road again. Austin Dillon was just on pit road again as well. Shannon? Well, for Jason Leffler, he came down pit road. His temperatures were a little high, so they went to pull some of that tape off the front grill and pulled too much. So he had to come back down so that they could adjust the tape on the front grill. But really been a handful for Jason Leffler, the handling of this race car. He had a lot of optimism coming to the race, but just not close, right? Sorensen leads him to the restart. 
Eric Almirola up on that top side. He had a nice pit stop. He's been running well, too. To the second spot now. See that upper groove starting to work. See Carl Edwards up there now. Almirola just shot up to the outside and took off down the back stretch. Elliot Sadler's crew. Remember, we showed the yeah. race off pit road. Picked him up a bunch of spots. Just joining us, Sadler had a speeding penalty on the first pit stop back at lap 52. Went from seven. Oh, trouble. Caution flag. Yellow, One yellow, spun around yellow, on yellow. the back straightaway. 44 car. That's Angela Cole. And the third yellow is out. Doesn't look like she's gotten any damage from hitting anything. 12 laps down. She's been in the pits quite a bit. That's what they're dealing with. But, uh, Good job there, Angela. Good job. You just got up a little high. Probably got in the marble. All right, so I mentioned Austin Dillon on pit road a second time under that yellow day. What's up? Hey, guys. Working. Hey, just working down here. Alan, let me get a little bit of information. I'll come right back to you. All right, we'll uh, let you follow up. In just a minute, Dillon, you see back in 20th place after the extra pit stop on the last caution. This caution brought out by a spin off of turn number two, Angela Cope in the 44 car. Uh, yeah, that's just getting up out of the groove a little bit. No grip up there whatsoever, but does a nice job not to hit anything. Safe. <laughs> Sliding in safe. That's good. So Cope uh, back around and going the right way, and uh, we'll resume competition here in just a minute. Free pass on this caution is going to go to Luis Martinez Jr. in the 39 car. His second free pass on the day. He'll get back on the lead lap in 22nd position. Back to the restart after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Big crowd at Iowa Speedway for the John Deere dealers of Iowa 250. Make sure to go to NASCAR.com for all your latest NASCAR information. Get ready to wrap up the third caution of the race and go back racing in one more lap. Follow-up stories from Pit Road, Mike Massaro. A big crowd in the grandstand, but also there was a big crowd surrounding this tire uh, recently. This is the right front tire of Ryan Truex that blew out. A lot of teams coming down here to find out what happened. Goodyear examined it. Their initial thought is it built up too much heat in the sidewall, and that's what led to this failure. However, they have not diagnosed it completely. They're sending down another engineer to make sure that's exactly what happened. They also looked at the tire codes. They are the right tire codes, so that is not a concern. Dave? And Mike, now we're ready to tell you about the 33 car. They had pitted once to make a right rear shock adjustment. There's uh, Austin Dillon right there. Car very, very loose. And then the second time they came down, it was a little bit overheating, so they cleaned off the grill, Alan. Dave, Mike, thank you. Green flag. Sorensen in the yellow car with Eric Almarola now outside of him in that 88 running second. Ooh, big stack up in the pack. Look at that. Everybody's going to get away with it. Still side by side for the lead into three. Well, not everybody's going to get away with it. That's Jason Leffler in the 38 with some damage. Comes Alvarola back to the inside. It actually looks like you can get away with the high side a little bit down in this part of the racetrack. Right, that was off right, right, a four yeah, now. That's Leffler has spun around. He's rolling. No caution yet. And it doesn't appear there will be. Leffler is clear. He's on pit road, and we stay under the green. And the chase continues up front. Here comes Carl. I gave you the field. 41 guys over two. Yeah, and there's both of them right there <laughs> battling for that third spot, making their way towards the front. But that's why Carl Edwards won the all-star race, and Brad Keselowski last night drove his way into the main race in the all-star race by finishing second in that showdown. These guys are pretty good. Yeah, they're there. You think they'll make it someday. <laughs> All right, well, that race the third settles down. Here's the trouble for Jason Leffler. Oh, well, looks like he got something wrong under the hood. I'm not sure what it is. Thought it was a tire rub initially, yeah. but looks like there's something going wrong. I mean, fluid came in there. and they put the hood, they, they had the hood up. You see, it loops it around. Well, not. 
today that Leffler was hoping for. I talked to him this morning. He thought they had a good chance to win. And now the car is going back toward the garage area. You have to wonder whenever they talked about making that other pit stop to get some tape off of it. They got too much. Then they came back in to put some on. So maybe they got a little too much that overheated. Yeah, they could have overheated the car even before that, before, before they that. got the tape off and yep. lost some of the water. And that uh, that starts up a chain of events that's never good. Second place, Keselowski up to the number two spot in that 22. Here's Edwards working Almirola for third. And through. Edwards rallying after falling back earlier in the races. Caution is out. Trouble in turn two. That is Amber Cope who has spun around. Almost the same spot. Yeah. As uh, her sister spun there earlier. Fourth caution of the race out here. Uh, not that long after the last one. A little strategy here, Andy. 119 last time they pitted. We're only at 128 and still got 122 laps to go. Yeah, this is going to be one of those uh, might split the field up. Some might come, some may not. Looks like the pit road still closed this time by, so we'll see that next time. You can tell we can have a lot of green flag racing. You can see once again, just up out of the groove. And the result of, uh, or the resulting action is the fourth caution of this race. Uh, again, just past halfway, sun is shining, it's beautiful. It's a little unusual because off in the distance we can see a storm cloud, but it's away from the racetrack and moving away. And uh, we're enjoying the sunshine right now and don't expect there to be any weather problems between here and the finish. But boy, they, the, uh, the radar and the weather forecasters have had their hands full figuring this one out today. Yeah, that's the other thing. The crew chiefs will be looking at the weather, looking at the radar. And right now, they can't make it from here on fuel. Tires hold up real well, so I expect the leaders will probably stay out. But you'll see some of the cars maybe come down uh, mid-pack or maybe toward the back. Not yet, not yet, not yet. There they are, toward the back of the lead lap. So under caution here at Iowa Speedway, most of the leaders stay on the racetrack. We'll come back for the restart in a minute. Robert Height was the champion two years ago, but this is their nemesis, Jack Beckman, with two wins in the last three races. Fast Jack is on a 300-mile-an-hour tear, and Forrest isn't happy. Finals on Sunday at 7. Straight liners going racing a little bit later on today over on ESPN2. Right now, as we work the caution here at Iowa, let's talk to our in-race reporter, Kenny Wallace. Hey, Kenny, DJ, you have a copy? Hey, DJ, hey, do you want me to pit or not, guys? Now come on, bring it to me. Yeah, I got a pit. Hold on. Yeah, I think we'll let him do some business. Leader for one, that goes. Spend no time, guys. Got okay, about two seconds. Two seconds. One, two. Fuck that hole up the headlight, right by the headlight hole. That's important. All right, let's go. Let's go, 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 go. All the way out, watch your speed. Watch your speed, heavy. Watch your speed, heavy. You're all good. Obviously, we weren't planning on Kenny making the extra pit stop there. No, but you can see he's had some damage on the front end of his race car. Trying to get that repaired where he can make a run towards uh, that top 10 in these last 118 laps. Kenny on the lead lap in 21st position as we get ready for this restart. It's like he got caught up in that stack up we saw earlier right before the caution came out. So it's Brad Keselowski in the 22 now to the outside of leader Reed Sorensen. Sorensen's been out in front of this thing since lap 57. About to complete lap 133. Can he continue to hold the top spot? Well, he's led 76 laps from the last time he led over 50 laps in a race three times. He's won all three times. Reed's car seems to be really good on these restarts. Once he can get single foul, he actually puts a little distance, but he hadn't had Brad Keselowski and Carl Edwards to deal with until this point. Yeah, they're ganging up on him now. It's like Keselowski's got the edge at the start-finish line. Here it is. 22 leading that lap. Side-by-side side up front, and Carl trying to find a way through. 
one thing that I'm seeing, and I started to mention this a, a few laps back, is it looks like you can run in that second group through one and two and not lose any time. But three and four is a different story right here. Don't Whoa, get six swords and get loose. Keselowski go off that corner. Though. Not for long. Here's Carl. Yeah. Edwards leads that lap. That clears him. Here comes the 22 back on the inside. <laughs> We're making three lead changes in four laps. I think so. It looks like Keselowski can get to the throttle earlier. It looks like Carl uses uh, a little later uh, time when he gets on the gas and makes it work. Yeah, sure. Sure. Anyway. You can see Ricky Stenhouse there in the sixth car. He's got in the mix. He wants to lead some laps here today. Two guys that have made the long commute from Charlotte, North Carolina, where they raced last night, to Newton, Iowa, where they're racing this afternoon. Back and forth at the front they go. That lap, it's Keselowski. Actually, that's two laps in a row he's managed to lead. Yeah. You know, and I'll say <laughs> one thing right here. These are two guys up front, and I know a lot of times people say, well, just let the nationwide guys go. But how about these guys just loving the race? They were racing for a million dollars. One of them won a million dollars last night, but they made the trip here to Iowa because they love to race these cars. Here comes Reed Sorensen. He wants to get back to the front. By the way, didn't get done racing till after 11.30 last night, East Coast time. Post-race interviews in Edwards' case for winning the race and so on. A few hours sleep, back in the race car. Oh, looks like he's still struggling with his race car a little bit. It was fast on that restart, and he's starting to slip back. Now you see Ricky Stenhouse take that third spot away. Brad Kozlowski, the only former winner of a nationwide series race at Iowa, entered in today's race out in front, past halfway. Edwards now in the 60, has slid back. He's running in fourth. His teammate Stenhouse running in third, Mike. Ricky Stenhouse comes here with a uh, sense of vindication, especially after what transpired here in Iowa last year. In that race, well, he wrecked two cars prior to the start of the race, actually damaged another car in the race. I spoke with him about that incident before the weekend began. He told me it was simply embarrassing. His crew chief, Mike Kelly, said at that moment, though, it was a turning point because that's when he realized that Jack Roush and this entire team completely believe in him. He comes into this race looking to put that behind him. A victory today would be absolutely gigantic for the 16, eh? And Mike, on that 60 car, they made uh, <clears throat> myriad adjustments again <laughs> on it the last time they were down. I know you'd appreciate that. Last time they were on pit road, uh, and they it is better, a little tighter on the gas, much better, but chattering left rear tire now and a little loose off. He just radioed that in last lap, guys. Dave Webster Burns reporting from pit road. Thank you, Dave. He got married in twice today. Twice. <laughs> a little farther back. Got the front four we just talked about. That two car right there. Elliot Sadler. What a comeback for him. Well, I think that's why he's the points leader. And I spoke in the countdown show that I think experience is why Elliot has got himself in the lead in the points. And that will continue to be a factor as he races for this championship. Yeah, that and a good pit crew. They yeah. gained a lot of exactly. spots on pit road today. Elliott got a speeding penalty on the first pit stop back at lap 52. It dropped him from 7th to 23rd. Did you know that Elliott finished 6th after getting a pit road speeding penalty in Dover last week? He shouldn't go higher than that today. <laughs> <laughs> rallies, rallies. Of course, at some point, team owner Kevin and Delana Harvick could probably sit there saying, I wonder what we could do if we didn't get a pit road speeding penalty. <laughs> yeah, and they're working hard on their own track performance part here, and you can see he's running there solidly in fifth, but Shannon, they're working on this car still? Uh, for, for Elliot Sadler, yeah, they've really been working on it, but the, the story of the day, as Alan said, has been all about uh, track position for Elliot Sadler. He came over the radio after that speeding penalty, told his Guys, hey, don't worry. We've got plenty of time. We'll get back out there, and that's exactly what he's been doing. Guys, it's been very busy over the radio as spotter Chris Rice has been talking him through the field. Those pit guys went to work and got him back up front. So Sadler running in fifth position uh, with help from the guys on pit road uh, on his uh, last pit stop a little while ago. Watching that race for second. Stenhouse moving up, starting to put a little pressure on Sorensen. Sorensen in 32. Remember, Reed was out in front of this race for 77 laps, a big chunk of this race's first half. And talk about how bad that first half of that last year was. 
the year since then has been that good because this young man has shown his talents on every type of racetrack that we go to. Two double duty guys in the field. One of them's leading the race. Brad Keselowski out in front. Still got 103 laps to go here in Iowa. Back live, Iowa Speedway on board with Josh Wise. Had a problem with brakes earlier in the race. He's 25 laps down in 32nd position. Not where he expected to spend his afternoon here at the beautiful Iowa Speedway. We're inside of 100 laps to go, and this is the race for the lead. Brad Kozlowski has been caught by Ricky Stenhouse. Stenhouse in the six, going to look low, see if he can get to that number one spot. And this is the type of race I've been looking to see from Ricky Stenhouse. You know, we've seen all year and, and it, back to last year where he's had a lot of speed but wasn't able to uh, capitalize and transfer that into battling for the lead later in races. So really good to see this happening here today. He looks like to have by far the fastest race car right now. Stenhouse, of course, the uh, Mississippi native. Racing to raise money a week ago for those affected by the flooding and the storm damage in his home state. Now racing to try and get a breakthrough victory for himself in this nationwide series. Been in the top five in the championship all season. Best finishes of the year so far. A pair of fourth place efforts, including last Saturday on the Monster Mile in Dover. It's a good, good kid. For people that don't know Ricky, he's, he's very, he's, he's pretty quiet, um, soft-spoken, got a good sense of humor, and just um, really, I, I guess the best word I could use to describe him is genuine. Yeah, he is, Alan. He's a genuine guy, but I, one thing that impresses me is his, you know, his confidence in himself. He could have got, you know, he kind of took a little bit of a, a rough patch last year, but it didn't affect his confidence. He's out here this year with a lot of it, and he can, you know, I think he is going to get that win soon. It might come today. Here's third place. Edwards in the white 60. Tried to take it away from Sorensen in the 32. Elliott Sadler kind of joining the party here. There's so much room to race here. I'm looking at the lap times, and they're all very, very close. And as a matter of fact, all these top 10, these top 10 cars are relatively close to each other. I mean, they're not really driving away. You can see Brad Keselowski and Stenhouse have a little lead, and then you got this group. Yeah, it looked like Reed Sorensen early on was just going to kind of run away from <laughs> the, the group. And they made a slight adjustment on his race car. He'd been talking about being a little tight off. Looks like maybe now they've got him a little bit loose. Edwards able to take that third spot away now. Sorry for the gasp there. I thought Carl was coming across the front there. And we were <laughs> going to have us a, a big old pile up right there. 32 car, Dave. What are they saying? Yeah, DJ's right. Looser <laughs> in was the report from the driver just about three laps ago. He has no front or rear grip now. That's a common complaint, but I think it's a looser in that's hurting him the most. Yeah, I don't know if that's exactly what you were going to report, Dave, but I appreciate you making me sound like I know what I'm talking about occasionally, so that's good. <laughs> but yeah, you just see, and it doesn't take much on this racetrack right now, as slick as it is, to, to make a big difference. And a lot of that is because of the speeds that they run here with it being seven-eighths of a mile. Yeah, one thing it'll make you looser in, too, is having somebody chewing on that rear bumper. Yeah. yeah. As Sorensen tries to hang on to the fourth spot, Elliott Sadler challenges him. We listen to the 32 radio. Just take what it's giving you. So just a fast set of tires. Don't flip out on them. Fred Owens, the crew chief, trying to be the, say, <laughs> sports psychologist there. <laughs> yeah. You get a little animated as a driver at times in there. And you think you've got a perfect race car, and you make a very slight adjustment on it and put four tires on it, and it just doesn't react like you expect it to. But as you said, you got to stay calm. There's going to be another pit stop. Hopefully that will work to, to their advantage talk about this racetrack being technically less than a mile a short track as nascar classifies them but yet being fast enough two cars race side by side aerodynamics come into play and the third car from behind joins the party we saw it a while ago when sadler caught uh Sorensen as he raced side by side with edwards and now we see michael mcdowell in the 18 come back into the pictures those two in front of him race side by side yeah it looks like reed torrance is trying to do a little too much with this car right now it's just not what it was earlier and he's just gonna have to Absolutely like chill out ridiculous. 
He's got to chill out here and wait till the, they can adjust it and make another run at it. Yeah, it's just so frustrating, but as you said, he is racing for a championship, and he needs to calm down a little bit in this situation and realize that we can go back and make another adjustment, but don't do something that you're going to really regret uh, and, and put you farther behind in this battle for the championship. Talk about another pit stop, but we are getting to the point in the race where we're going to be able to make the finish on one tank of fuel, and so this next pit stop could be the last adjustment these guys are going to get to make on their cars and track position being what it is. Speaking of track position, who's going to have the best track position here? That's for the lead. And Stenhouse is going to get through and grab the number one spot. Well, he, he was very patient making this pass, Allen. He, he st stayed right behind Keselowski, didn't push the issue for many, many laps. And then I think he saw his opening and just kind of made the pass pretty easily. Yeah, he should sure have. But this 60 car is really coming fast as these guys have slowed down just a little bit up front. Now we'll see what Ricky Stenhouse can do as he's gotten out front now. But Carl Edwards is on the move. So just, just to pay off that conversation I started a, a second ago, Andy, one more shot at adjusting the car, and you're going to have to make it the right one and not give up track position. Yeah, you really are, are just going to get one more shot because the tire holds up good. As soon as they get inside that window, which they're there now, they're inside their pit window of making it to the finish. So if a caution comes out, they will make that pit stop. But they can go about probably 30 more laps before they need to think about doing that under green. And it probably will just be one more uh, because the tires are holding up really well. Track position. We heard Carl Edwards uh, talk earlier about it's a difficult place to pass some. So all of those things are going to play in. They're probably just one more time on pit road. And, Alan, you're exactly right about making that adjustment. I would have to say at that point in time, you don't swing too big at it. So it is now Stenhouse Jr. leading, Edwards second, Keslowski shuffled back to third, with Elliott Sadler fourth and Reed Sorensen in the number five spot. 83 laps to go, that critical final pit stop still to go. We're back to Iowa in just a minute. One hundred and seventy laps complete here at Iowa. That, though, is this morning. Carl Edwards, fresh off of winning the million bucks in last night's all-star race in Charlotte, arriving around 1030 this morning. Brad Keselowski got here just a little bit earlier, around 950. As we started the race, Justin Allgaier started at the back of the field, had a practice crash. Right now, he is running in 12th spot. That is 31 positions gained. Back to the front of the pack, though, on lap 136, that's Brad Keselowski taking the lead from Carl Edwards. But just a few minutes ago on lap 166, we talked about opportunity in this race, and that is what's happening. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. just took the lead. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. has been had a great season thus far. He's done a good job. Uh, Dale Jarrett pointed out he's really patient, took his time to make that pass on Brad Keselowski earlier, and is doing a super job staying out front. This could be the guy who gets that first time win that we've been talking about. That's the five hour energy rapid recap. One of the drivers who's had a little bit of issue today, Jason Leffler, that 38 car a little bit earlier in the race, spun in turn four. He's been in the garage for a little bit now. Shannon, what's going on? Uh, a little bit of problems is an understatement, Nicole. Take a look at that. That is a radiator hose on the left that blew off of Jason Leffler's car. On the right is what it's supposed to look like. His temperatures were right at about 300. He blew that and the water pump off. They've replaced the water pump. They've replaced the radiator. During that spin, he also blew off a brake duct hose. So it is a complete mess down here. These guys have been working feverishly to try to get this championship contender back onto the racetrack. For more on all of this, what's going on down here in the 38 garage, let's go over to Tim Brewer at the Craftsman Tech Garage. Tim, Thanks. can you we, explain this stuff? <laughs> it's going to be a tough one. But we run a lot of pressure on the radiator system because we want to run a lot of water temperature. And enabling us to put tape on the grill lets us run a lot of pressure. But these are sealed systems. We actually charge them with a nitrogen bottle. But we've got the Cavalar line right here, and it's really light. It'll maintain a lot of pressure. But some of the guys, they use stainless steel hose, and it'll maintain a lot of pressure. But still yet, how it blew all that stuff off, never seen that before. Yeah, well, hang around long enough, right, Brew? You'll see something you never have just about every time. Just Ricky Stenhouse just saw his teammate go by him and take the lead. Carl Edwards back on point. He's really taking a while, but the yeah. cream seems to have risen to the top here. Yeah, and he looked like, you know, after that restart, he was really sliding back after about three laps and he got back there. And I don't know if he changed his line some as we see him a little bit higher down in one and two. Bump doesn't seem to be quite as bad in that second groove, but he's really come to the front. Now, Stenhouse might be learning something from his line right now. 
Jack Roush here looking on today as well as Stenhouse tries to come back. David? What a great race, Alan. There goes Ricky to the inside, trying to take it back from Carl, and he's going to do it going down into turn one. The point I was going to make was regarding the way these cars change over the course of a run, DJ. They aren't always at their best. Sometimes they come to a driver, and uh, it seems like Carl's was doing that. Michael McDowell was terrible on the restart. Then he was fast, and as Carl looks back to the inside, can you tell us you know, why that is mechanically these things change? Yeah, I wish I could tell you all of that. I might still be going at it, Dave, but it, it, they do change, you know, and, and they go through as the air pressures build up in the tires, the cars start doing different things. We're getting more rubber down on the racetrack. The temperatures are going up on the track. So there's a lot of variables that change. And Andy, as you keep going, the shocks change a little bit. The springs all change. So there's a lot of things that can happen. It's a relative thing, too. I mean, it's other cars around you, how, how your car is performing against them. And uh, all these cars are different. They have di little different setups. And it's, it depends on how they use each corner of the car, each tire on the car. And if you, can, if you don't abuse one particular tire, your car will come to you later in the run. So what you're both seeing is there's a myriad of reasons. Why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, there we go again. <laughs> Good race for 10th spot here. Stephen Wallace in the 66, Michael Annette in the 62, and uh, we documented the story of Justin Allgaier in that 31. This is a big race for that 62. Michael Annette is an Iowa native, and this is a place he just really wants to score at. While we watch that on the right side of the screen, there's the race for the lead around lap traffic. Oh, no. Oh, that's not good. All clear. Good job. That was risky. Clear by three. <laughs> and Carl Edwards back out in front. Another three wide battle. Oh, team cars. Careful. These two are racing for a top ten spot. Stephen Wallace has that tenth spot right now. Annette wants it. Our crew chief change on that 62 car here this weekend. Larry Carter is calling the shots for the 62. Rusty Wallace telling us there will be a new crew chief in place for that team uh, of the permanent variety starting next weekend down in Charlotte. Talking about Michael Annette, best finish this season, 13th place. Needs to, they need to get it, get it going, and uh, no better place than here in his hometown track. Yeah, I talked to Rusty earlier this week, and he said that they just haven't been able to get the combination right with the 62, and so he, he felt like he needed to make that change now and try to get this thing turned around. Looks like it's going pretty good today. Yeah, changing over to these newer cars full time this year can create a lot of problems for teams, and and certainly. Uh, when you don't have a cup affiliation, it, it, the process may take a little bit longer. And I think that's some of what Rusty and them are seeing. They're trying to get their bodies a little bit better, doing everything that they possibly can to get Stephen Wallace and Michael Annette the very best cars they can each and every week. And recapping the story of that 31 car, Allgaier set the fast lap in practice yesterday and then crashed on the next lap. Had to bring out the backup car, never got any practice on it. Started at the back of the field and has uh, chipped his way back toward the top 10. He's running in 12th right now. Yeah, in a situation like that, where you come out here, you have no laps, you, you want to try to make sure as he battles for a championship, make sure that you minimize the damage in, in that situation. And Justin Allgaier has done a nice job today doing exactly that. He's going to battle here and uh, get himself up into the top 10. 64 laps to go. Carl Edwards and Ricky Stenhouse Jr. are the leaders. Final pit stops coming up. We're back after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Next Saturday here on ABC, we head to Charlotte Motor Speedway for the Top Gear 300. Coverage beginning Saturday at 2 Eastern time. Kyle Busch back in the field. Can anybody stop him? on the sports hometown track. That is next Saturday, the Top Gear 300 for the NASCAR Nationwide Series, 2 Eastern, here on ABC. Well, that racetrack takes on a whole different character in the middle of the afternoon. Sun shining down on it, so it should be a fun race to watch. Bring back that old, like bring, this one is. Bring back that old nickname, the Beast of the Southeast for That's the daytime right. race. Race for the lead in lap traffic. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. in the six. Carl Edwards in the 60. Stenhouse. Just sliding by Carl Edwards a second ago to take the top spot back. They've really they've swapped the lead back and forth pretty good bit in this one. I think Stenhouse gets out front. His car gets a little loose. And, and then he Carl loses gets the lead. Yeah. 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 And then, <laughs> then once Carl gets in front, I think it tightens his car back up. He's able to go back to the lead. See if he can hold it a while here.
Oh, he's sliding it off a two right there. And here goes Carl. Just takes that little bit. I think he'd seen Carl use that upper groove a little bit, but you can see as he jumped back to the throttle, he just lost a little bit of traction on the exit. Still battling, though. Still got the lead, too. Stenhouse by a bumper. If Carl gets back by him, this will be the sixth time these two have swapped the lead between them in this stretch of the race. See, now, early in the race, that just wasn't possible to, to hold on that well up on the high side. You see Stenhouse pulling by a car link there by being able to go through three and four on that high side and carry a lot of momentum. You know, I got thinking earlier this week with this being such a big opportunity race for guys to possibly get their first win. Guys like Carl Edwards, we've seen move through the Nationwide Series to the Cup Series. How long did it take them to get their first win in the Nationwide Series? Seven for Carl, 18 for Kyle, up to Brad Keselowski, 49. Stenhouse is kind of right in that range. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and he keeps putting himself in that position. It's going to happen. And, you know, even though there's only two Cup guys here today, if this race could play out like this to outrun Carl Edwards who just outran the best in the business last night in Charlotte in the Cup Series it gonna mean a lot to this young man yeah it'll add a lot of credibility to a win if he could get it today that Carl Edwards is behind him Mike you got more on Stenhouse yeah he's running extremely well but you wouldn't know it by the conversations he's had over the radio with his crew chief Mike Kelly the car not exactly perfect throughout the course of the day he's been complaining a little bit about the brakes saying they don't feel right at one point mid race that actually did some work to the brake ducting pulled some tape that fixed it for the time being but that problem has reemerged he still senses it every once in a while and on top of that he says it's running a little bit hot so uh, not a perfect race car but he's making the most of it for sure <laughs> well mike they're never perfect you got to keep working on them all the time you notice that every time they make a pit stop they're making changes uh, so they just got to make it the best they can and then it's up to the driver to make up the rest of it Edwards back out in front. We've got 16 cars on the lead lap. Now 15 as Mike Wallace in the 0-1 is put a lap down by the leader, Edwards. We're coming up on pit stops. Leaders last stopped at lap 111 under the yellow flag. Yes, we've had two more cautions since then. 13 laps of yellow total. But we're going to begin to see some of these front runners on pit road. And as I say that, here's the first of the lead lap cars to come in here. And this is going to be with 48 laps to go. Well, almost an accident there on pit road. All right, Dave. Hey, guys, and he gives up 11th position to uh, go for that pit stop, albeit slowly getting in. He said about his race car, it's the best it's taken off all season. So he really didn't want too many changes. Balance pretty good for Michael. Uh, Michael and that running in the 11th position before this round of green flag stop started. That little uh, hiccup's going to cost him a lot of time on the track, though. Might keep him from being on the lead lap when this all cycles back around. You we'll see right here. He thought that he had time to get in there. See the 44 car, though, is exiting her pit. The right end that would be a lot of distance on the racetrack when he it gets hurt, back. It hurts the pit stop as well. You know, you see that it really messes the crew up to get to the car, and uh, not to mention all the time it took to get in the, in the stall. See Edwards and Stenhouse. They've put a pretty big gap on Brad Keselowski, who has fallen four seconds back in third place. So if this thing runs green all the way through, that's a nice help, too, heading on to this round of pit stops. And what's the biggest thing? If you're a crew chief, you're telling your driver about this pit stop, Andy? Yes. Don't, don't get speed. a speeding penalty. <laughs> Shannon? A solid top 10 run for Stephen Wallace, who just gave, in, came, gave up 10th to come down pit road. They're going to make a four-tire change for Wallace, who says he's been looking forward to this race all season long, guys. Of course, his dad built the track. We've been talking to him over the radio. Dave? Shannon, he avoids the 66 leaving. That is Michael McDowell coming in. Very, very hot right now. He thought he was losing power. In fact, they're going to clean that front end very well. In fact, blow it out with a with an air uh, pressurized air to try to clean that all out. Four tire change for him. Not bad balance, but just felt like he was losing power. Lost one position since that last run began. The 32 of Reed Sorensen in as well. Remember his car, he was reporting looser in. 
and no front or rear grip on that car. So trying to get the guy who led over 70 laps in this race earlier back on track where they should be. Austin Dillon got lost in the back of the pack after making all those adjustments in that 33 car. Has not gained very many positions. In fact, only three since that last restart. They'll make big changes for Dillon on this putt stop as well. James Busher on pit road. Austin Dillon headed back out. Coming to you this time. There's Busher in for his stop, Dave. And James Busher is in. One and a half. And actually, I'm looking at the wrong car there, guys. Not bad, but he said he wanted to cut the center of the corner just a little bit better. So an air pressure adjustment, Shannon. Well, Dave, cleaning the grill is another request from Elliot Sadler. There's a lot of junk built up right there. Four tires for the man who came in as your points leader. He's been battling some tight conditions, but they said to go ahead and leave it alone. And the leaders come in. Carl Edwards and Ricky Stenhouse. One and two follow each other down pit road. Keselowski comes in as well. Stops with 41 laps to go, Dave. Battled on the racetrack. Now battling on pit road. He will get a track bar adjustment. Will Carl Edwards still loose? If he says the car is a little bit tighter up off the corner, it'll go faster. So they're going to fuel him up with Sunoco fuel, change four tires, and try to beat his teammate, Mike. Big stop for Ricky Stenhouse. You can see how hot this car is running. Steam coming from the overflow. The stop has been completed on the right side. The team switches around to the left side as they complete their four-tire stop on the six car. Brad Keselowski off a of pit road as well. They'll try to help him. He was tight in three and four, needed a little help turning in the front end. They'll make an air pressure adjustment and a four-tire change there as well. Drew Herring, still in the back of his mind, was a flub on the first pit stop of the day. Did not get the RPMs up high enough and stalled, exiting pit road. He's apologized for that several times throughout the course of the afternoon. We'll pay attention to see how clean it is as he gets off pit road this time around. The team completes their stop. They drop the jack and problems once again for Drew Herring. Right, Slow again, didn't You're have okay. the RPMs up high enough for the second time today. Well, that'll hurt. He had driven his way up into the top five. I think he was fourth when this round of pit stops started. Leader on the track is Justin Allgaier. Allgaier pitted. No, we got to pit about 15 laps here. We're just going to try to catch the yellow 24 60. Allgaier pitted under each of the two cautions where the leaders stayed out so he can run more. That was Jimmy Ellidge, the crew chief you heard. Yeah, they might as well take advantage of this. Like you said, the tires are not falling off that much in speed so they can afford to stay out here and run this car until it needs fuel. So Allgaier, Kenny Wallace, Mike Wallace, and Jeremy Clements have not stopped yet. Then you will get back to Carl Edwards, who right now shows fifth, and Ricky Stenhouse Jr., who shows sixth. And they're the only cars on the lead lap. There is Brad Keselowski behind leader Allgaier, shown as the first car one lap down at the moment. Now, on the exchange of pit stops, watch the gap between the 60 now and the six on the racetrack. Yeah, it's about two seconds, so Carl Edwards and his crew doing a great job. You can see they took a little extra time with Ricky Stenhouse, had a little bit of trouble, plus they were trying to get a little bit of more of the debris on the grill off of there and maybe a piece of tape. Well, they needed to. You can see the steam coming out of that car. That worries me. Uh, to see that much of that steam coming out. All these cars today seem to be running hot. I don't know, you know, really what's causing that. It's just uh, one of those days where maybe they misjudged the, the amount of tape that they put on the grills, but uh, a lot of cars hot. So that will be the lead if we stay green and the rest of the stops cycle through. For now, though, there is your leader, Justin Allgaier, in the 31 in his backup car, hanging on, hoping he can catch a break with a caution flag in these final 35 laps. Back live at Iowa Speedway, and the caution flag is out. You see that Brian Scott has gotten the very worst end of an incident down in turn number one that was caused when the leaders came up on some slower cars in traffic and things stacked up. Yeah, these cars are a lot slower than the leaders. See Stenhouse gets into the back of the 11 as they stack it up. I don't think that Brian Scott had any idea that Ricky Stenhouse was coming that quickly. Well, he didn't really he have down a choice. to avoid. Yeah, he had to get around that 93. Through. Just that, that car was so slow, he had to make an evasive move that put him right on the front bumper of Stenhouse. This is three wrecks in a row for this 11 team, though. Uh, Darlington, when it started, they wrecked there. They wrecked at Dover. Now they've torn up another car. It's not going well for Brian Scott. 
So Scott tries to avoid the car of uh, Amber Cope in turn one and moves down into the path of an oncoming Ricky Stenhouse Jr. And NASCAR officials have sent the 93 car to the garage for the balance of the race. In the meantime, Justin Allgaier is going to get a chance to make this pit stop under the caution flag. He put himself in a great spot. He had all of those cars lapped down. There's only six cars on the lead lap, so and if they're not going to get a be a wave around or anything here because these guys have already pitted. I don't believe Andy. They're going to make another pit stop. I think they're out there to stay. And so uh, the the gamble that Jimmy Ellis and that crew did is going to pay big dividends here. Yeah, it is. It's going to get them past a lot of good cars they were racing, and uh, it's only showing right now six cars on the lead lap. Yeah, caution coming out where it did. Brad Keselowski had just gotten himself in front of Allgaier, so that put him on the lead lap. Eric Almarola is going to get the free pass under this caution. And Allgaier is going to restart no worse than sixth. Yeah, we're going to get some wave rounds. Looks like Almarola will get one of those. He'll be uh, either the lucky dog or the wave around, and there may be one more, a couple more that will get it. Yeah, not going to be any wave because, well, yeah, I see what you're saying because of where those guys are. Kenny Wallace on pit road, one of the guys that had not pitted yet. Jeremy Clements had not pitted yet. We mentioned Allgaier. Mike? Uh, Justin Allgaier saying he's a little bit tight through the corner. His crew chief Jimmy Elledge asked him before this pit stop, which would you prefer, a little wedge or a little track bar? Which has the biggest effect on the race car? Allgaier said take a little bit of wedge out. That's what they did. Also a four-tire change on the 31. What is going to happen is that Carl Edwards is going to assume the lead of the race and a whole bunch of guys are going to come back around and rejoin the lead lap and restart at the tail end of the field. We'll set up the whole restart for you in just a minute. But let's say we've had a late twist of plot here in Iowa today. <laughs> and who knows, we may not be done with the drama yet. Great crowd on hand today for the NASCAR Nationwide Series here at Iowa Speedway. You can be part of the crowd at these upcoming races for this NASCAR Nationwide Series. Charlotte next week, Memorial Weekend, traditional stop. Then uh, a new little twist in the calendar, off to Chicagoland for a race on June the 4th. Michigan, Road America, Daytona. Join us at one of these upcoming races. Uh, check out NASCAR.com slash tickets and uh, be with us at the track. There'll be a number of cars, about 10 cars, rejoining the lead lap by the wave around in a moment. But while they're still cleaning up the racetrack, let's uh, take advantage of the town time, get in another break, then come back and race to the finish. Carl Edwards is going to be the leader when we go back racing in the closing laps at Iowa. It's a beautiful place. It's been a very exciting race. Iowa Speedway, just outside of Des Moines, where the NASCAR Nationwide Series runs for the first of two times this year. Look at the grandstands. Sold every seat they had. And the weather's cooperated after some forecasts of a good chance of showers in the second half of the race. We're down to 25 to go, and sun's still shining brightly. And we've seen a little bit of a twist in the look of this race after the long green flag run that saw Carl Edwards lead onto pit road. Then the caution come out before everybody had cycled through. All these cars between the pace car and Carl Edwards in a minute are going to take advantage of NASCAR's wave around rule, and 10 of them are going to be back on the lead lap. Yeah, it's certainly changed the, the way this race is going to look, and I was actually looking at the wrong car while ago when I was speaking uh, as to when I, when I didn't think there were going to be many wave arounds, but there are going to be, but they're going to have to start behind these other cars, too, that are behind Carl Edwards, so even though they have that wave around, it'll be uh, tough for them to see some damage on the six car, Ricky Stenhouse there. Yeah, that's from that contact that brought out this caution with Brian Scott, and I was wondering if there was any damage there. We'd get a good look at it there. I'm not sure it's going to affect the handling of the car, but you can see he does have some damage. Wave around the rule NASCAR put into effect uh, among a couple of changes years ago when they stopped racing back to the caution flag. These cars not allowed to pit under this yellow, but they've stayed out on the racetrack, basically trapped between the leader and the pace car, so they get the wave around before the restart. So Elliot Sadler, Reed Sorensen, Michael McDowell, Drew Herring, Scott Wimmer, James Busher, Steve Wallace, Austin Dillon, 
uh, Michael Annette and Joe Nemechek all rejoin the lead lap. Yeah, they're all beneficiaries of that wave around rule, and the reason we have that rule is to assure that the leaders will start up front. Before, you would have leaders starting, you know, mid-pack or worse in this case if that hadn't, uh, hadn't been in effect. So you see how they'll line up for the restart. NASCAR has just waved off the restart. You see how they'll line up at the front of the field. A couple interesting names in there. Justin Allgaier, this sure worked out for him. It did. Jimmy Elliott pulled a really good move right there. Uh, he's trying something just to get his car some track position because they started in the rear. They got a backup car. This really was a good move for that team. Yeah, and Kenny Wallace uh, in that 500 start today, he's up there in that fourth spot. You know that he made that late pit stop still working on that race car, but they've got four fresh tires on this thing now up in the top five. 51 car, Jeremy Clements in position to get back on the lead lap. Strategy working to their favor. He's now running up inside the top six positions with a chance at a great finish. NASCAR repositioning some cars for the restart before they let them go. So now you've got Brad Keselowski back there in that 22 car. He pitted under this yellow. Fresher tires than the guys in front of him. But with a few cars to get through to get back to racing with Carl Edwards and Ricky Stenhouse. Yeah, a lot of things that could happen here in these <laughs> next 23 laps. Let's see how it works. Here we go. Clears Stenhouse, gets the lead. Allgaier slides in third. That's Kozlowski sliding up behind him in fourth. 17 cars on the lead lap. And 21 laps to go. This is third place. Kozlowski is through. Stenhouse gets against the wall in the front straightaway. He has really been flirting with that all race long. He's been using the whole racetrack coming off the floor, and he gets against the wall there. 32 Sorensen, remember, led a lot of this race in the middle stages. 77 laps of this race, that 32 led. Then the handling went away, and he really slipped back in that long run. It looks like that they've gone back, and this set of tires, an adjustment they made. Oh, well, it's Sadler. Eric Almarola have a little contact there off the floor. 19 car, Mike Bliss lurking. Yeah, another solid run for Mike Bliss. You know, he had a great run going last week at Dover and got caught up in that uh, last lap incident. Ooh, 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 whoa, Almirola right up in front of Michael McDowell in the 18. And for the lead. It's exactly what we've seen on these restarts. Carl Edwards' car in the 60, really good for about three or four laps, and then it falls off, and it takes it about... 15 or 18 laps to come back. He only has 18 laps to get back to Ricky Stenhouse here. Of course, he's not far away. The last driver to get his first win in a Roush car was David Reagan in this six car. Guess who his crew chief was? Mike Kelly. Mike Kelly. Yeah. Of course, we saw Carl and Ricky, these two drivers in 60 and 6, trade the lead back and forth six times between them in a green flag stretch of the race. Allgaier falling back a little bit in that 31. Kenny Wallace there in the 09. And Sorensen trying to move through. Yeah, Sorensen looks like he's really got his car back to handling like he wants it. He's going to need a late race caution here to get himself back up in the mix for the win, but he is moving forward. But we're there. It's 16 laps to go, so it's, uh, it's time to make his move. And so he had Sadler in the two trying to move through. And does. While we watch this racing for position, they have black flag. Brian Scott, after that crash, repaired, back on the track. NASCAR wants some more things fixed up on that 11 car. He is going to head back to pit road. 32 Sorensen up to fourth. If not for that one stretch of race, Dave, 
Yeah, Alan, and remember he was uh, kind of screaming on the radio during that time? At least during this last run, he radioed to his crew, not as bad. Now, that means that he's still not completely happy with it, but at least now, riding in uh, the fourth position, he's able to see the front runners. The fastest car on the track that last lap. Needs a caution, though, Andy, right? Yep, he's got to have a caution to be able to do anything. You see how far he is behind the front three as a result of that side-by-side -side racing. Look at that gap. He's yeah. got a long way to go. And it is a front three because Brad Keselowski is kind of chopping away at this lead that Ricky Stenhouse has, too. That's exactly what Stenhouse needs. He needs Brad Keselowski chewing on Carl Edwards' rear bumper while he can drive away. Scott Zipidelli making a call to position Kenny Wallace up front. And the way the yellow flags fell worked out. The 09 car having a solid effort. Yeah, the same car he ran at Richmond and ran really good. I talked to him at Dover. He was so excited to come here. 500th start in the Nationwide Series for Kenny Wallace. Nice pre-race presentation if you weren't with us for that. NASCAR President Mike Helton uh, making a nice presentation to Kenny Wallace commemorating his 500th start. Eighth, ninth, and tenth here. Steve Wallace, 66. Austin Dillon, 33. Maybe we'll theme this one. Members of famous racing families. <laughs> Jeremy Clements there, 51 as well. So Drew Herring trying to make his way back forward. And his dad, Tony Clements, builds the engines and basically runs the team. And members of the Pearson clan working on that car as well. Of course, David Pearson won the five inductees into the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Ceremonies to be held in Charlotte, North Carolina tomorrow. Not missing anything up front. Still a few car lengths between each of the top three. Some of the action back of the pack we're looking at. It's Michael Annette, home state Iowa driver trying to work his way back through and that running right now in 14th place and behind him side by side also How about Scott Wimmer in that 70 car Scott aboard that machine this week here in uh, Iowa got some damage on the right front you see but lead lap doing a really good job See Brad Keselowski now trying to get that second spot from Carl Edwards. So eight laps to go, and this is exactly what Stenhouse wants to see in his mirror. As these two guys trying to race each other. Overtaking the Brian Scott machine, who gives way to the faster cars. He wants to see it from a distance, though. They're still <laughs> a little bit too close. Seven laps to go. Will it be a first-time Nationwide Series winner? Or will the two Cup guys find a way to get out front and take home the trophy from this opportunity day at Iowa Speedway. Well, Dale, what do you think? It's seven laps to go. You've never won one of these things. You've got two of the best behind you. What are you, what are you thinking right here? Yeah, you're, just, you're trying not to pay attention to what's going on behind you. You need to just be looking out the front. Let those two guys settle that. Hit your marks, and you have a fast enough race car. They shouldn't get to you and be of concern. No. That's, that's, what, that's easy to say. <laughs> yeah. 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 As you saw in that uh, the last shot, some clear racetrack ahead for these front runners may get into some of the tail end of the field before the checkered flag, but for yeah. now, clear racetrack. But I do see Carl Edwards' car right now starting to come to life a little bit more. He Fastest was car of that lap. Five laps to go. Carl Edwards made the effort to come all the way here to Iowa on Saturday. Spent 45 minutes behind the wheel of his car practicing before scrambling to the airport, flying back to Charlotte. Brad Keselowski had Sam Hornish Jr. do all the practice in his car. They've come through and established themselves as two of the three drivers racing for the win today. I'm not sure if it's those two cars or that four-turn wall that's more of a hazard for Ricky Stenhouse. <laughs> and I watch him you know, every time come off of that corner. Look at him again, right there. Again, uh, those black marks, I think all of those are his. <laughs> Three to go for Stenhouse. Last year's Rookie of the Year in the Nationwide Series. As we dip back, look at the race for ninth place. In some traffic. James Busher in the 30. Austin Dillon in the 33, all over him. Wallace, Bliss, Herring. 
know, we talked about Austin Dillon in this 33 car maybe being one to battle for the victory today, but they had made two pit stops under a caution back about midway of the race and just never recovered from that, but still a good solid effort by this young man. Coming to the white flag, lap traffic ahead, Carl Edwards behind for 23-year-old Ricky Stenhouse Jr. One lap away from his first NASCAR Nationwide Series win. Can he come back around in front? I think he's got him. After almost losing his ride, being sat down just over a year ago, the promise fulfilled today at Iowa and the first Nationwide Series driver to win a race since March of 2010, Mississippi's Ricky Stenhouse Jr. is a winner. Great fight to the finish for that ninth spot. Look at Carl Edwards congratulating his teammate. Yeah. Great win for Ricky Stenhouse Jr. Yeah, and that's the way to do it. You beat the best right there. Yeah, I know there were only two of them here, but he beat both of them in second and third. Uh, speaking of the cup drivers, so uh, Ricky Stenhouse will remember this race and being his first win, and even more so because he was able to beat Carl Edwards and Brad Keselowski. A little friendly bump from Allgaier. Congra congratulations. Andy asked you what it was like when you were trying to get the first win. What's this moment like right now? Well, it's that you can breathe again now. <laughs> we were talking about how cool and, and calm you needed to try to stay, but you really, your heart was pounding. So this is really a feeling of accomplishment, all that you've gone through, and uh, very deserving this young man. Came to the Nationwide Series a year ago, had such a difficult start. To the point, as I alluded to a minute ago, where Jack Roush sat him out for a race. Just let him gather his head back up. But while he was sitting him out, also sat him down and said, I believe in you. The second half of last year, particularly after the debut race for this next generation nationwide car at Daytona, where Stenhouse came through with a spectacular run. It was like a light switch came on. And we've been waiting for this moment ever since. And now today here at Iowa, in his 51st try, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. is going to go to victory lane for the first time in the Nationwide Series. <laughs> All I can think of is how cool is that? Yeah. Jack Roush here today. Wonder what he's going to tell his young driver in victory lane. Very nice. So a one-two finish for Roush Fenway and uh, the winning crew chief. And he called his name out a few minutes ago. Mike Kelly is with Dave Burns. And you know, a couple weeks ago, talking with Mike Kelly, he said you would never have thought this, but our little racer has turned into a leader on this team. What do you think your leader today, Mike? Man, I can't say, I can't say enough for this kid. What we've gone through as a team in the last year, Iowa, last year was incredible. And uh, I can't thank, thank Blackwell Angus. I can't thank Ford. Ford's uh, done a lot for us in this nationwide program. Robbie Reiser, all the guys at the shop. It's been a long time coming. We've been close a lot of times and uh, shot ourselves in the foot a couple times this year and just really capitalized on it today, no, making no mistakes. Ricky doing his job, us doing our job. And it, uh, it's, been a, it's been a long ride, and it's, uh, it's a great one. All right, Mike, go celebrate. He referred to Iowa. Remember last year, Ricky practice crashed. He crashed in qualifying. A third car was rolled out for him. It was a long day, but today much, much better. Shannon Spake? Well, Carl Edwards just ran out to congratulate Ricky Stenhouse Jr. What a weekend it's been for you. You win the All-Star Race. You've got your teammate in front of you, one of your biggest competitors be behind you. How was your race today? And you asked me, could I have caught him? Are you kidding me? That's as hard as I can drive. I asked for the wrong adjustment at the end. Mike Beam and the guys did a great job. We had Polaris uh, off-road vehicles on board. They make side-by-sides, four-wheelers, and um, we appreciate them being on board our Fast and All Mustang. The, the Mustangs were fast. Our car was really fast that earlier run. I was going kind of easy the run right before the final one. I asked for some air pressure adjustments that I shouldn't have, and, man, I was loose. Ricky was loose, too, though. He, he just uh, he did a really good job. I had one of those Blackwell Angus uh, steaks yesterday, and I won. I didn't have one today, and I bet he did, so... Uh, I'll be eating one next week. Well, he had a steak, and he's got a million dollars from the All-Star race, guys, but a great race for Carl Edwards. Alan? 
One to finish for Roush Fenway Racing and in victory lane, the seventh driver to win for Jack Roush in this nationwide series and the newest, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. getting ready to celebrate with his team. Mike? And Ricky Stenhouse taking a cool drink of water, getting out the driver's side window, getting drenched with water. Again, confetti blowing in his face. And a big hug from his crew chief, Mike Kelly. An emotional victory lane for Ricky Stenhouse. It was a long time getting here for this kid. Let's pull him out of the scrum. Obviously, it was a lot of work, Ricky, getting to this point. What's this win mean for you? Oh, it means a lot, man. I tell you what, that last call, I was doing some praying just for a good restart. My restarts hadn't been that great all year, but uh, it came through, and uh, I got to thank Nationwide Insurance for this. Uh, awesome series and bringing all these fans out here to Iowa man they're awesome and uh, I couldn't pick up a better place to win and Black Angus Beef is on board this weekend and that's awesome Whew. it was a rough year last year especially here at Iowa considering that how much of a sense of vindication do you have right now standing in victory lane yeah it was a rough one I was I was definitely not my favorite place or wasn't uh, it is now but uh, yeah we crashed I think three cars that weekend and uh, to come back this strong uh, it says a lot to these guys. These are the same guys that were with me then, and they stuck with me. Uh, Jack Roush, Ford Racing. Man, it's just a blast. An incredibly emotional victory lane, Shannon. You can understand why this kid has fought very hard for this first career win. Well, Elliot Sadler still fighting hard to be your points leader. Leads by seven points. Of course, you had the pit road speeding penalty. Would things have turned out differently? Could you have won this race if that hadn't happened? Yeah, probably. I, I definitely put my team in a hole, but my guys had such good pit stops. They got my track position back for me. Um, can't say enough for everybody here on one main financial team. My first time here to get a top five, to get caught a lap down there at the end and still fight our way back. Uh, we're very happy, very pleased with our run today. So I learned a lot during the race that will definitely help me the next time we come back. Elliot Sadler really working all the lines here at Iowa today in the race, and he is your points leader. Dave? Fighting for this championship, Reed Sorensen picks up three points on championship leader Sadler, but what happened in the middle of the race, Reed? Well, I think we had a hole in the right front. It came in about, I think, 12 or 13 pounds less than it was supposed to and uh, it was hard to drive I was like man what do we do this thing because the uh, the car was so good and uh, all of a sudden I couldn't I couldn't even make a lap by myself so it was uh, it was pretty low so had a hole in it somewhere and uh, that last run um, you know we came up through there pretty good able to get back in the top five and uh, get a good run for this Dollar General car just want to win so bad and um, when you have a car that good it's hard to hard to swallow when something something like that happens but We'll, uh, we'll get back out there, uh, keep bringing good cars to the racetrack, and we'll get this DG car in the victory lane over there. Thanks, Reed. Uh, lead laps gained a little bit on the championship. Alan? Dave, thanks. Emotional in victory lane. Yeah, it's great seeing a first-time winner. Uh, everybody loves to see that. Talked about, I uh, wonder what Jack Roush would say to his young driver. Mike Massaro is going to get the chance to ask him. And we're going to find out. What would you say to Ricky? Well, I asked him what happened to the front of the car, and I told him you put a Darlington stripe on it, and it wasn't even a Darlington. He said, yeah, I did it three times. His dad and I agreed they did it with Finesse, so it was okay. But it's, I, I can't tell you how honored I am to be here with Ford and to be here with Mike Kelly and to be here with Mike Beam and, and, uh, and Chris Andrews and all the guys that made this nationwide program go. The engine did a great job today. Of course, we got the new FR9 Ford engine in, and... Uh, just awesome. I, uh, Ricky Stenhouse is going to be a factor in this stock car racing for many years to come, certainly long after I'm gone, and I'm glad to be here for day one for him. Alan, certainly a great week for Jack Roush's entire organization. They win the All-Star Race last night. They put a first-time winner in victory lane today. Uh, interesting statement from Jack there. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. made his name known today. He'll be a factor for many years to come. Yeah, Jack knows how to pick these young drivers out and give them a great opportunity. So while Stenhouse just gets the celebration cranked up in victory lane, remind you that next Saturday, this nationwide series races at the sports hometown track, Charlotte Motor Speedway. Always a fun day. It is on ABC at 2 Eastern time next Saturday, part of a big motorsports weekend next Sunday. The 100th anniversary Indianapolis 500 telecast presented by GoDaddy.com. That's a week from today at 11 a.m. Eastern on ABC. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. with his first nationwide series win. Thanks for watching ESPN on ABC. So long from Iowa. Drivers, start your engines. Thank you, everyone. It's hard work all during the week. And uh, let's uh, have a good day. Have some fun. The fans at Iowa on their feet and we're underway. It was a 
Trouble in turn two. Ryan Truex blew the right front tire. And this is the type of race I've been looking to see from Ricky Stenhouse. The promise fulfilled today at Iowa. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. is a winner.